Hello, everyone, and welcome to another riveting, encompassing <laughs> episode of Hospitality Marketing Live Show number 276. And yes, folks, that is not a made up number. We have done literally every week for going into many, many years now our uh, weekly episode of This Week in Hospitality Marketing. It used to be called hosp Hospitality Digital Marketing, but you know, I've lost the vanity and I've decided that digital is no longer a necessary description as to hospitality marketing. It is a component of it all. A Zen-like experience happened to me. Uh, with me is the uh, ever brilliant man of meta or uh, uh, heavy meta as his podcast is so professional. <laughs> heavy meta. I just, every time I hear that, I think of the ACDC, but that's just because I love ACDC. Uh, Mr. Dean Schmidt with uh, Basecamp Meta and Meta Search Marketing. Mr. Dean, hello. Hey, how are you? how's everybody? Um, it is, you know, actually, I, I love it sometimes when we don't start with a gang. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> it gives a chance to kind of ease in, you know, a little bit with it. We're a week before Thanksgiving, and even though technically holidays start Thanksgiving, uh, for Halloween, we're okay, now we're into the holiday cycle. Yeah. I don't think it really historically has kicked into high drive uh, until Thanksgiving, and then you roll into what used to be Black Friday, what used to be Cyber Monday. Uh, then you have this sprint between it and Christmas, which seems to be all too fast and all too brief. Uh, and then you have your Christmas shotgun and the New Year's, and poof, all of a sudden it's 2021 please. Uh, <laughs> and then you've got that dead space in there that everybody's kind of wondering, okay, shouldn't we be doing something? Exactly. And, you know, it's, it, I'm actually, it's, it's going to be fun, really, that we get a chance to talk a little bit because uh, we're obviously going through a whole nother surgence of this. And even though there's a vaccine on the way, three new, you know, three of them so far now. Uh, there's also this, the logistics. Hello, Melissa. Hey, Melissa, if you want to join us, let us know. Um, oh, 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 we've been hacked. We've been Zoom trolled by, who's this guy? Who, who the man that? in black. Man in black. <laughs> man in black. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the thing with black guys is when you've got young kids uh, who have muck, paint, stickers to follow their hands, it all blends into a black T-shirt. You can't tell. You can't right. tell I've been, you know, <laughs> I, I, I was I was gonna say uh, smeared on my kids there, but that's yeah, literally what happens. Oh hi, Danny. You have a good day. Yeah, yeah. Well, All right, okay. Just watch how they, if he holds the pan up to the camera and does this. Put your sunglasses on really quick, you know, just in case he's got some <laughs> flappy thing or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, zap people. No, it's been yeah one one hell of a week, gents. One hell of a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Ben, a pleasure to see you once again. Um, always. We were just, I was just asking Dean with the fact that now you guys don't have the traditional Thanksgiving on the dates that we have it. I mean, you have Thanksgiving, so to speak. But isn't that now October where you have kind of a thankful th feast or something? Or is that more of a Canadian the, thing I'm thinking in of? In the UK, we do not have Thanksgiving. At all? At you all. don't have a thanks day? No. Nope. Uh, no. Nope. But well, well, whilst I was working with a lot of Americans, we'd take full advantage of the additional uh, public holiday. <laughs> Absolutely, guys. Matt, let's let's give thanks on Thursday. Out, out of office is on, and I don't expect to hear from anyone. Uh, oh, you're no. a bunch of savages over in New Guinea. <laughs> we'll we'll celebrate it with some turkey twizzlers, uh, and I might drink a Budweiser. You know, just uh, <laughs> just just to channel my inner yank. Uh, so, no, when, when officially, how officially does your holiday cycle kick off? Because, like I was going to ask Dean, we're in a we're in a resurgence. You guys are in a lockdown. You know, life is grand. Um, life. It's certainly something. Um, I mean, uh, again, this year is a little bit of an anomaly. Uh, we're in lockdown until the start of December, where I think I touched on this a couple of days ago, the government swear blind. Well, as you know, they've gone from saying there will not be an extension of lockdown. So it is our hope and plan that there will not be an extension of lockdown, which is going to become, guess what, gents? There's a lockdown uh, and you can't leave your house at all. But they were saying there was a really great sensationalist headline the, I think it was the Daily Mail, which was something like, killing your family for Christmas. Right. Oh, okay, go on. You've got my attention. What now? <laughs> if we, basically, the premise is, if you take five days in December, you'll be burying your family in January, February. And everyone was wow. like, just chill your beans, man. Like, <laughs> let's try and get into the holiday spirit. There's some Christmas adverts out now. The holidays are coming and all that jazz. Just call your jazz. Yeah. Um, but no, uh, this, um, we... 
I mean, people, I don't know what it's like over in the States, but people here have started decorating the house already, putting the Christmas trees up, putting the decorations. I fight until the very last moment last to keep the glitter and the joy out of my living room. Like, we do not need this giant tree. There's lights everywhere. And that's why you're so popular with the kids. I just see my utility bills just in, like, September, October, November, December, when we basically light the entire the street up. But I feel like this year I might be losing the battle. Wow. So if, if I turn up next week, mate, with, like, a garland on and my, my room looks like some kind of fairy cave, you'll know why. Oh, hey, okay. another Guinea oh, Guinea oh, native. Kill <laughs> <laughs> all the joy of Christmas. Let's get rid of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying oh, so yeah, hard right. to. I really am, mate. Well, we, we we're, we're, we're on the path of ta ta talking about how we're supposed to go over and tell people to stay at a hotel when uh, <laughs> we're being told not to go out to the side of our houses uh, yeah. for all of this. And I was going to hit the brainchild of Mr. Dean with MetaSearch being one of the first primary conversion points associated with if I do have to go traveling somewhere, I have noticed that there is that spectrum growth that has become more defined in colors between one versus the next. It used to be kind of blurry. It either wasn't spoken of or it wasn't referred to or people did it, but they didn't talk about it. Now there's a definitive strata of people. Those that are going, those that are going, but with some restrictions, those are going with a lot of restrictions. Those aren't going at all. I mean, it's very clean lines. As we're talking to friends and family as to whether we're going to attend a party or we're going to try to get any sort of family members together, there is definite no's and conditionals. Mm -hmm. And it's before it was kind of like, oh, we'll think about it, we'll let you know. But now it's getting kind of real where you got to make a choice. Are you going to show up? Are you not going to show up? Are you even going to ask people to come over, not go over? Are you going to go over to somebody that's asked you? And now you have to make choices. And it brings up really odd questions. So what you've been doing? Have you been going out to the restaurants? <laughs> have you been going? Out, have you been traveling? Have you been kissing other people's babies? You know, just. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it gets into some really weird questions, and and I know that translates to what we do, marketing wise. Like, how do we translate over that for those who have made the decision? How do we get in front of them to say we've done this to make it even one less worry for you for all the other stuff you're worrying about? I don't. I know it's like a level. <clears throat> Especially in the UK, our our media is dominated by one day it's we are within touching distance of all these vaccines, these magical vaccines, and the next day it's you know don't dare look at your grandparents. Uh, magical vaccines, don't look at your family. Magical vaccine. So the, even the message from the mainstream media is so it's con so contradictory because I mean I know they catch one good news or bad news all the time, even though they managed to run bad news from March to September. So I, I think with our I find it really interesting because there's going to be a there's going to be a group of people who I mean I don't want to get too deep into things like vaccines but there can be a group of people who do take the vaccine a group of people who don't take the vaccine and that's going to be another line and I don't think that'll be as, like some people might get it eventually some people will get it as quick as possible the other people are like no I am in Bill Gates injecting five G into me and you can get you know you can get to hell and I think as marketers one of the interesting challenges we're going to have is how do you how do you message? How do you message your property to the different spectrum of people? How do you reassure people who haven't taken the vaccine or still don't want to take the vaccine that it's COVID safe, while still trying to get some kind of normality of messaging back to people who have taken the vaccine? Not I'm suggesting it's the be all and end all of this, but who are looking towards the end of this, and I don't know the answer. If I'm mm. honest, so I've sort of answered well, your question with another question, Lauren. <laughs> and I, you know, I would I would piggyback onto that with uh, well, I'm going to steal from Stewart here actually a little bit from comments that he's made in the past. Mm -hmm. that those people who have decided that they are going to get together as a family, that they are going to travel, and and I'm isolating out those who have to, taking out the have to. So those who have chosen to, I'm saying, uh, they've already. They know what the risks are, right? They, they've already made that conscious decision of that. I know what the risks are, and I'm either comfortable with it or don't care about it or whatever the case may be, and it doesn't matter. But they've already made that choice. So now we have to market to those people that have decided, yes, I'm going to do this in spite of everything else. How do we market to them? And and the, the answer you might say is, well, we have to make them feel comfortable. We have to show cleanliness. And, and certainly you don't want to look dirty by any means. You, know, you have to show the cleanliness. But again, remember, they've already made their choice and said, I'm comfortable with doing this. So is, is that necessarily the, the first and foremost thing that they're looking for? Yes, it's important to them. But is it the is it the driving factor? Does that make sense? 
Mm. Yeah, and I think you're hitting on something, which is the, the nuance of it, right? And I think this is lost. People try to say this is how it is for everyone and put, make blanket statements. And it's really not. Every individual is at a different point in how they're dealing with this pandemic and how they're recovering from it, how they're coping with it, and whether or not they're willing to travel. One of the most interesting stats that, that we stumbled on in our sentiment study and really, we didn't notice it the first time around, but I think it's insightful. And, and it goes back to the conversation we've had before about the first time you go to a grocery store is is you're panicked, right? Your fight or flight is is on high alert and you're, you're looking at everyone as the enemy. And then the second time, you're a little more relaxed. And then by the 10th, you're, you're not. It, it's Once you can get someone to be open to the idea of travel and actually dip their toe in the water, the chances of them traveling again is very, very high. The data we looked at the last time we did a study, which was right before Labor Day, said 53% of Americans had already traveled. Of the people that had traveled, more than half of them had stayed in, in uh, made more than one trip, which tells you something really interesting, right? That once people realize that it's safe to travel and they have a, a relatively good experience, they're going to do it again and again. And you saw people have made trips, four, five, six, seven, eight trips since March 15th. So I think for us as, as marketers, we, we can't necessarily anticipate where everyone is, but we can say, what can I do to nudge people in the positive direction towards responsible travel? Okay. And if I look at the people that haven't traveled, the best thing we can do is show them examples of other people that are traveling responsibly. We can show them social proof that it's okay to travel, give them permission to travel, take the stigma out of travel, they're going to be more likely to do it. But then you also say, well, I know these people have already traveled. You need to be using your own data more than you ever have to really try to convince those people that have traveled to come back repeatedly for short stays more frequently than they ever have. If you do that, you, you can, you can to Lauren's quote, you can build your bowl of rice one grain at a time. It takes a little more strategy, a little more delicate, intricate marketing, but you can do it. We've seen it again yes. and again. I'm going to go something back to something you just said out there, actually, that really caught my attention. To giving them permission to travel and taking the stigma out of travel. And, and I think that that really hits the nail right on the head. How do we give people the permission to travel without them being stereotyped and almost, uh, you know, people pointing fingers at them going, look what you did. It's your fault, you know, and, and taking that out of that. Yeah, it's responsible travel, right? It, right, it's, right? It's giving people to travel and not be reckless. It, it's encouraging them to follow the protocols, to explain to them the things you're doing to protect them, your staff, and other guests. You, you do, you do, Dean, you hit on something. There is this uh, permission to other people's permission where I was talking to somebody that was attending a conference. I'm like, oh, well, you're being safe. Oh, 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 it's just down the road. I drove. I didn't have to do it. It was like you had to do these these disclaimers yeah. like, no, no, it's right. totally safe. I, you know, I'm wearing a mask. I've been, you know, walking around with a hazmat suit. It's like they have to do the disclaimer thing. So, yes, your permission base to it is there. But uniquely, a question to Dean. For most of our earlier conversations for months, you were in an area that was relatively unaffected. You were, you know, we don't wear masks. Yeah. We don't, nothing, nobody's got it around here, blah, blah, blah. Now, you guys are the epicenters almost. Okay. Yeah, I, I will you tell know. you very that's you're very true. We have been very privileged actually in rural Nebraska here, and that a lot of the stuff that's going on with COVID was something that was happening over there and it didn't impact us as much. Um, that has changed. It is at our front door now. And yeah. and it's to the point this week, for the first week in all of COVID, I can actually tell you that I know somebody who's infected. Okay. So <laughs> Up until now, it has always been six degrees of separation where you knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody and so on. And so it gets real. And I tell you what, you know, I, I know this is not, you know, everybody else is going, well, yeah, we've been there forever. Uh, and so I'm not saying it to say that I'm in any special circumstance by any means. I'm saying it because, folks, it's real, you know, and, and it's it's hitting everywhere now. Uh, so you do have to be responsible. And there's just no way around it. But that, that hits on the point that everyone's at a different point, right? Everyone has had a different journey through this and is exactly. processing and coping with it differently. And so anticipating how where people are is 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 not really practical. So you just gotta try to figure out what, what psychological pressure can you put on people in a in a in an ethical and safe way. What what pressure can you put on people to encourage safe and responsible travel? And I really do think it, it is a 
a responsibility of the entire industry to be promoting the fact right now that safe, responsible travel is okay and reckless travel won't be tolerated. If we, if we can universally get behind that message, we're going to recover a whole lot faster. Yeah. So you, you talk about um, permission to travel, um, and I think the, the, the idea of, of the peer pressure of permission to travel, when we, when we start to normalize travel again, um, mm-hmm. and it, it doesn't become the thing that people give you, like the evil eye, how far are you traveling? Are you going 5K away from your home? I'm just mm-hmm. going to quickly call the cops and get you locked up. When we normalize it again, it's going to become easy to do. But the challenge is, when, I mean, I still visit a client websites, so and the first thing you get hit with when you're there is pop-ups about COVID safe and how we wash everybody, we can spray everybody, every opportunity. It doesn't matter if you even work here, you get sprayed. <laughs> Videos, like drone shots of going around the hotel to show you that it's been – like, that's not normal. That's some yeah. weird dystopian. I would say they're doing it wrong, honestly. <laughs> I think they're doing it wrong. I think I the mean, information needs to be available. And it needs to be prominent, but it should not be the primary message on anything. But then again, even when it's prominent, dude, we, as long as that's still, pro- I don't know what the answer is. I'm sort of spitballing ideas here. Maybe there's a whole, maybe there's a way of I don't want to see this message again. Like sort of opting into cookies. Don't show me mm-hmm. this COVID message again. I'm happy you're secure. But there, there is the need for information out there, and, and a really classic example. So um, my wife family is down in Louisiana and we haven't visited them for Christmas in forever and we're really due and so we're trying to figure out can we go to Louisiana for Christmas right now that, that's a couple weeks away and things are going to change between now and then let's pretend it was this week okay so I booked my flights down from Nebraska down to Houston actually and we're going to drive over but can I drive from Houston to Louisiana can I cross that border from Texas to Louisiana I don't know Right. And, and that information is not readily available to me. It's it's difficult to answer that question uh, and, and things like that, that we've got to be able to answer easily. And I think as hoteliers, it's our responsibility to help our travelers know that. Yes, yeah. I definitely agree and, that there is an expansion of needed information beyond just the what are we doing to keep you safe? It's how do you get here? How, what do you have to be considered as laws, regulations, all that stuff? Yeah. And Lauren's been a champion of this since the beginning, you know, just being a resource for people that are seeking information about your local area. Like if you live near that border, you should have information on your website about that, whether it's open yeah. or not, what the process exactly. is. Things like 100%. Yeah. But, you know, I think what we also have to fight, you know, and I'll, I'll quote one of your, your, your brethren from Australia, Stuart, um, <laughs> is that, you know, if, if enough people cross the river with the alligators and nobody gets bit, then you begin to get this, oh, it's okay until somebody gets bit. And that's what we're at right now. The COVID is one of those things where until, like to Dean's point, you don't know somebody. But I can honestly say, you know, firsthand or not, you know, going to a hospital is a completely stripping of your personal identity experience. You no longer are in control of your life once you walk in that door. And and you may have a say as to what's being done, but not really. You're more being told what's happening. And and. Uh, it's heartbreaking to see and to know some people a little bit more in the firsthand experiences that went in the morning saying, I'm fine, don't worry about it. And boom, they're making the news that night because they're gone because it happened that fast. And none of their family were with them when it happened. The tragedy of that running around is profound. And, and it is a scary thing. It's just we don't look at every time we get in a car that that can happen to us because we've got airbags now and you know whatever happened, laws. So we're still into the realm of we don't have things that help us prevent this from happening yet and no vaccines or anything like that. The only thing we have is a, 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 a polarization of mask usage, you know, that has been politicized in our side. I don't know. In, in England, is it pretty much consensus that, hey, wear a mask or you're going to get shot by our neighbor? <laughs> uh, I mean, our right to bear arms is slightly... Okay, well, beat them to death with a stick. Um, but the, the general consensus is, yeah, masks. And it's in the, the odd ones out are the people who don't wear masks. And okay. everyone think, thinks the same thing. What is your medical exemption for not wearing a mask? If you have a medical exemption, is the is this shop really the right place for you in a pandemic? Or why don't you just you go home and wait yeah. um, There was And there was a change. It was probably a few months ago. But it went from masks being, oh, that person's wearing a mask, maybe we should take it seriously, to that person isn't wearing a mask, don't you dare cough on me uh, at all, you absolutely infected walking beacon of virus. I think one of the, one of the things you mentioned there, Stu, is, is a great idea about you. And we've talked about this on the show a lot, about first-party data and about using it as much as you can. Like the, 
I don't know whether or not one of the reasons some hotels don't do this is either they don't know how to do it or they prohibit it by cost. But a really great way would be to to download download all the email addresses from these gathering with the guests that are stay between March or wherever, upload them as a customer match into display and our essays for Google and target the people from a search marketing perspective to target the people who you know have had a stay. And when they go back to top of funnel or comp set or brand or even just you know in market for it as an audience, target them because you know they've been here before and you know again they've not been bitten by the alligator, so they're more likely to cross the stream again. We found mm-hmm. out recently one of our what uh, one of our, a brand name competitor uh, charges two hundred and fifty dollars every time um, they upload a customer match list to a, an, a, an ads account. So if you are prohibited, dear, dear listeners, if you are prohibited from doing so by a brand name competitor, anybody on this call, any <laughs> any four of us here, any four of us here could do that for you. For not, I'll do it for yeah. nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to sign up with me. We'll just do it for you for nothing and set it up for you. Because That's the idea true. that even now, the, the agency is still trying to squeeze every little cent. That's like walking up to a man dying of thirst in the desert going, yay, I could save yeah. your life with this bottle of water if you give me yeah. 100 bucks. It's going to cost no. you. It's going to yeah. cost you. The that, that's the, the same as the agencies that charge you to put tracking pixels or beacons. Oh, on, yeah. On yes, those are, they're, they're and then inside. charge you an annual fee to have the thing they did one time. <laughs> yeah. I, I, my, my latest podcast and my continued podcast are actually going to be about broadcasting and communication. You know, a matter of fact, my last podcast was about podcasting, which is weird to think about hospitality marketing. But it's like I, I've been an advocate of saying, well, there's podcasting has its medium of listenership compared to a video that you have to watch. Audio can be listened to, as we all know from doing podcasts, in a variety of contexts. They could be driving and listening to your podcast. So if you can find a medium in which people can, by pre-arrival letters, letting them know, and I think it's a brilliant idea what you said, Ben, it's like, taking the segmentation of your arrivals and giving them more specific information perhaps as to what they have to consider before arriving. Mm-hmm. Just as simple as that segment out that anybody that's outside of the state needs to have, um, you know, different information than those inside. Tammy, you got a really neat icon. I don't know what that is, but that is super cool. <laughs> cool. I have to fix the camera. Give me a minute. Sorry, guys. Go ahead and keep talking. No, but it's cool. I'm talking about your icon now. <laughs> hey, can, I, can I just say, too, that, that what you just described can happen automatically if you use the Fuel AI powered CRM? You don't have what to manually. What an amazing tool that, that is. That is, that is, that is that, wow. It automatically happens. Oh, amazing. Hey, by the way, uh, Stuart, I've got to give you a little green. Uploads to Google, to Facebook, any syndication you want, and then you can automatically target. So Okay. I, I just got a little just problem me. with the fact, Stuart, that you have not come up with a Mandalorian head uh, helmet that has a uh, rebreather on it uh, for uh, COVID. I'm, I'm, that is the way. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the last episode before the one that came out today, but it can't even work. The real one can't even work underwater, which blew my mind. So I was a little surprised by that too. I thought there'd be a little bit more of the, uh, whatever. Yeah. yeah but it's not it's not space, but not underwater. <laughs> <laughs> hey, careful spoilers guys. Hey, no, <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you're not caught up, that's yeah, your own problem. You, yeah. You if you're not keeping up. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I'm up to where you are, but not everybody's <laughs> opening it. No, 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 I'm not. Thanks. Uh, thanks to it. Uh, <laughs> at some point the man lauren takes a bath that's all you need to know that's all you need to know yeah, water's involved <laughs> but anywho so tammy you're going back and forth with a microphone i think your camera well yeah I, w- I was just gonna chat you um i need to change the camera it's using but i don't see how to do that in the settings We'll just uh, we can steer. Well, click on the little something. icon, the little cog icon, and it says audio and video settings. Mm. I don't. Today's a good day for me. I get my brand new super duper Mac Pro M1 chip laptop. Woo! Oh, <laughs> Happy birthday to me! <laughs> you know, when I got my last my 2017 MacBook, I think 2018 MacBook, I video my own unboxing. Hey. Yeah, that's that's exciting. I actually read an article yesterday from someone who said they had the tricked out MacBook Pro, whatever that was like, a ton of extra RAM, and the new laptops were even faster. Yeah, even though it's the lower one. So yeah, yeah actually, the the bench the bench testing on the M1 chip is faster than every other uh, Windows laptop out there currently, and it actually is matching against some of the desktops on their on bench testing. 
Is the battery problem sorted out? Because the last series were kind of terrible. No, uh, right now they're saying the battery is still good for ten to fourteen, which is okay. pretty wild. But I mean, uh, for me, I'm running on a five year old MacBook Pro because you know when you buy them, I always buy the as best I can and then let it last for five years mm -hmm. or more because <laughs> they're damn expensive. But it's like. <laughs> You know, when I was waiting for this chip to come out. You know, yeah. Just the, the smug packs that you have to just swallow when you buy Apple products. Yeah, well, yeah, there's yeah. the super cool brand tax, the super cool it's cool to be cool tax. There's lots All the of environmental stuff. friendly tax, which, which is doesn't mean it. It doesn't mean it. And, and my, I got my 12, too, so I was all stoked. I got my little case oh. for today. Wait, does it come with a charger? Apparently, they, they, they take away charges. No. Remember, but, remember when you can buy a home phone for like 20 bucks? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. In all seriousness, this LiDAR thing is crazy. If you have a choice between the iPad, the 12 and the 12 Pro, go to a Pro because the LiDAR thing is insane. What's that I do? I mean, well, a couple of things. One, you can you can measure anything. at a, Yeah, well, it makes coffee. It makes coffee come from here. Uh, <laughs> well, it does other stuff. I don't want to talk about that. Um, but the uh, in a room, it'll measure anything in the room. Like you can just look at the room and then say, "Okay, what's that?" It'll measure. It could take any image. You could take it out and put it in another room and actually two spec size compared to the room size. And when you do 360 pictures, it'll do full depth total focus. So when you do the 360 pictures, everything's in focus and it's in it's in perspective and shape size because it measures all the distance, which is just so crazy. No, don't Plus, wrong. the nighttime pictures are cool. So I am uh, uh, such a fanboy. I really am. You cut me, just pip, pips would fall out. But when is enough enough? Like, never. When is enough never? Because you know what? Book. I gotta Ben. I gotta also let you know for Christmas you gotta pick up an Oculus Quest, dude. Just saying, you gotta join us on some Population One. Shoot some things. I've got to get on that yet. I haven't downloaded that. I think I've got. I, I think I've got. I've got a rift or a quest. I've got one. Cool. Whatever it is, oh. join us. We got. We need. We need squad members. And I, also, Stuart, the new for, Star Wars show. The, the, the new Star Wars game is out. Uh, uh, um, Galaxy's good, Edge. Good, yeah. Oh, good yeah. guy. Yeah. Take, take my money. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at, at the risk of offending Lily, should we get back to hotel marketing? Oh, <laughs> silly us. Yes. Uh, and Tammy, uh, you're uh, always, you is... need you need to get on this quest too because we need people that actually know what they're doing on it. So come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just worried that Lily will ch tune in late. Oh, yeah. She's going to be here and then she'll tell Smack us, us. off and not be yeah, on Yeah, she will actually. <laughs> <laughs> hey, by the way, congratulations, Tammy and Stuart. Excellent presentation. Phenomenal content. Truly awesome. Thank you for Thank putting you. that all together. Thanks. It, it's easy to look smart when you're standing with other really smart people and you just did nod and agree with, with Tammy and Dan. It was really easy. Just make sure you're in the picture when they take it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what, what they said, they, they were great. See, and I was missing the same thing, but with Stuart and Jessica <laughs> and Dan. <laughs> That's fine. No, it, it was long overdue good on. content. It was really good that you guys put that out. I think it's probably one of the benchmarks of this entire year of what HSMS put out, to be honest with you. Thank That's you. how well I thought it was. So yeah. it, it and, and very relevant for the times and so forth. So Tam, it's it's cool that we have you back after all the craziness stuff that you've been doing. <laughs> you guys pulled off an awesome engage. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah, we did a, a six, six hours, hours of content last week um, virtually. So it was it was fun. Um, some really good stuff on tech on SEO. Some great customer stories. So. Um, I was a little, a little sad that you guys didn't cover uh, schema much, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think Tammy likes schema. I don't never. No, I don't think she. I don't think she. I don't think she respects the value of schema. I, I think it's kind of one of the yeah. Yeah. schema train, Tammy. Yeah. Well, it's so funny. Like one of the questions on Wednesday, you know, and Jessica, you're like Tammy, you've said schema is your favorite word, and I'm like, do we have 90 minutes to talk? <laughs> so I, it's really interesting. Um, our our VP of marketing joined us from a very well known SEO tool set and said one of the reasons he joined was because a lot of people talk about schema, but then a lot of people implement it and don't see results. But we had case study after case study showing like when you do it right, when you really think about it, the numbers go up. In fact, I would, um, was just looking at a retailer right now that we're working with that in one week from launch, they're already up 10% in clicks 
you know, and I mean, it's early, it's one weekend, so who knows what all, and it's, you know, this, but year on year improvement, not pre post. So it's really cool yeah. stuff. It, it just goes to show that doing something you haven't done before that's a value can make a big difference, even at a time you didn't think it would make kind of an impact. I mean, yeah. that's the kind of stuff that block and tax stuff. By the way, Stuart, you have corrupted me because when I do my podcast, there's super cool, nifty tools of eccentric stuff to do. Mm-hmm. I now do the Stuart disclaimer. Please, kids at home, remember all block and tackle must be done prior to doing something crazy like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's well, the thing, right? I mean, and I'm Stuart and on his podcast, you try, you know, but we all know it's, it's you got to lay the foundation first, right? If you don't mm-hmm. have, you can't go to Oculus Riff if you don't know what, you know, how to work the mouse, right? Or how to have the basic platform set up. You, you need to have the base platforms to build on. I mean, even with schema, I love schema, but if your website is garbage and you don't have good content, you don't have good details, you're not going to see as much of an improvement. So it's all mm-hmm. about really laying the right foundation and understanding what you need to do to be successful and getting that built in first and then playing with all the fun, cool tools like Oculus Rift and, Star Wars games and <laughs> all the that's others. Mar- that's called market research, Tammy. That come on, that's right. <laughs> business wise, market yeah. research. Right. Yeah. I'm watching me and I claim it as a tax deduction. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Beta Immortal is a great tax deduction. I'm sure you're. You know, yeah. You're Hello. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess it lends itself to our earliest conversation too. We've shifted, and we've talked about this for months now. But really, we've shifted from room and rate to how can we answer your questions. And that goes to having a content-driven, answer-driven, useful uh, website that people can find, find for what they're looking for to find it for. And that's where schema steps in. That's where good content steps in. That's when proper uh, communication steps in with the CRM and engagement and pre-rivals and everything else that we talk about, that block and tackle stuff. And making sure that all those things are done as best as they can before you start doing super cool stuff like three-dimensional videography of drones flying around with spray bottles. Just, you know. <laughs> yeah, before you do that, make sure you have an FAQ on your website. Make sure you have a search, keyword search on your website. Do those two things before you start doing shiny objects. Just, just infecting uh, flying uh, spray drones. Uh, it's a good FAQ, you think? Five seconds to apply. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, you come up with the best ideas, but only you can execute 90% of them. <laughs> And sometimes not very well. I'll just let you know right now. The success rate has a ratio. <laughs> it's like I'll walk in and go, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be really fun to try. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's fun to try. We, we go down in a blaze of glory. That's for sure. Exactly. We, by the time it's dead, it's dead. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like a Mythbusters episode. If all else fails, just make it go boom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Myth, myth confirmed. This doesn't <laughs> work. <laughs> hey, I have to say, Dean, I completely ripped you off recently. So the first time we met was at HSMAI back last year, right? When you did your yeah. um, your myth busting meta search session, which was oh really yeah, cool. Um, I totally ripped off the format and did that for myth busting mobile apps. And, and, and used the MythBuster logo, really followed your format, and it went down really, really well. So thank you. <laughs> cool. You owe me a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> or a beer. Oh, look. It's Speaking me. of MythBusters, or who's, mythical. Who's busting, who's busting my myths? <laughs> uh, Mr. Ed, Mr. Ed and I had a very lively discussion yesterday. Okay. No, no. Po- it was all political. It was all, all about whether... And being wrong, me being right, it was typical, you know, whatever. <laughs> he says that. Don't even buy though, it. Don't buy it. Even though I agreed with him. <laughs> so He did. But he, as in typical Ed form, simply argued with me to argue. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see the problem with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm agreeing with you, but I'm going to go completely contrary to what we're just talking about and go I on the other side. You're wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it really, 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 really well. Actually, it was a fun conversation as always. It's it's enjoyable. So, needless to say, yes, um, it, it's rare for Tammy to be with us. Tam, <laughs> and in all honesty, schema has been something that is not talked about enough. And I know you guys have gone to. How, first of all, can you share some of the numbers you had with Engage? I mean, how did it go? Yeah, um, you know, it actually went really well. I mean, uh, we had. We had about 50% of the signups show. We had about uh, total unique 
just under just shy of 500 people sweet anyway you know so and some people a lot of people uh hopped in and out based on that was the me. Discussion. That was me. yeah of course <laughs> uh so about 500 people total um and in some that compared to normal in person you know actually it was much a, a lot higher number than the in person yeah. so um we typically get 100 to 150 like over the years it's grown so about I think last year just shy of 150 uh in person mm -hmm. some big differences right so when we do it in person it's a day and a half event there's a lot of fun and frivolity uh, you know on both sides like we go out to dinner afterwards as a like huge group of everyone is left over and celebrate and so all of that kind of stuff didn't happen of course because mm -hmm. you can't do that virtually uh, but the content, the messaging was really, was really good. And we had some, we bring in a lot of guest speakers. So um, we had a couple really cool topics on core vitals, uh, on schema. And, and this year we did a lot of pairing. Like we had uh, Marriott spoke with, uh, with Anil with our, on some of the things we're doing to help with messaging. We had Sprinkles Cupcakes talking with one of our product heads. And so it was a good mix of not just nerdy technical people, but also uh, <laughs> customers explaining in English. So, and then I showed up and announced a few names uh, for our customer panel, which was which was fun. But you really did have great diversification. You had some really incredibly talented people globally that were on it that were really very talented and very knowledgeable what they're talking about. It was really nice to hear. Yeah, and even on the customer front, so we we had two. Uh, we two hoteliers. We had Theo from Remington spoke, which was fantastic on the independent hotel front. And then we had Steve Fitzgerald from uh, G6 Motel 6 speak on the brand side. And we had, now I'm going to, uh, we had VMware. We had uh, Renault, which is an automotive group out of Mexico. Uh, we had US Bank. And I feel like I'm missing someone. And I'm probably am because there were six and I'm oh uh, evergreen home loans was the other one so it was kind of a mix of different industries different brands but it was it was cool to hear how different industries apply things I think the more we play with different industries the more we realize that it's all the same it's just taking the the blocking and tackling and just tweaking it slightly to fit the industry mm -hmm. Just one thing going back to one of our earlier conversations about communication to the guest and arrival and so forth. And, and sir, you pointed out I'm a big advocate of the videography and so forth as a medium to convey some of that information. Is there, and this is a legit question because I'm facing playing with a toy <laughs> about video, is that it creates hotspots in the video to highlight what you might want to know more about, like a hotspot of the cleaning supplies on the top and the countertop or a hotspot of the amenity in the room. Do you think that's going a little just, I mean, geekish like people would actually understand to use it or just like you know just show that it's there and leave it at the video i mean do you think it's worth the effort no, no. okay <laughs> no i mean honestly i'm asking because i'm, I, I'm know, with it right now. i, I, I love it right? and, and i nerd out on it and i think it, it's it's a lot of fun but when you're dealing with the public you've got to really cater to the lowest common denominator and, and you know i think you can do experimental things that aren't mission critical but, but I would keep it simple, stupid, as much as possible. Stuart, you're right. Lily has shown up. <laughs> We're on topic, Lily, I promise. <laughs> now we are. We're for the first 25 minutes, but now they're on topic. <laughs> All right, just in time. Just in time. I, you're, so you're on topic just now. Coming. Lauren, going back to your, your camera thing that you were talking about earlier, though, with that, the, oh, you were talking about the, sorry, the 360 video you could do off of your phone. Um, sorry, you had a name for it. I can't remember what it was called, actually. Lear oh, LiDAR. 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 Thank you. LiDAR. So if that is so readily accessible on something like an iPhone, is there any excuse for a hotel not to have 360 views of their lobby, hotel rooms, and things like that? Seems yes. like it should be easy. Because it's only available in the very top end of iPhone right now, and I don't think many other devices have it either. Well, so, Google Street View will allow you to make 360 videos. That's always been around. Right, but this, this, this is specific, more the specific thing about device support, um, it's just starting. So should you have it on your roadmap? Absolutely. Are there other uses for it? Yes. Like So there are other reasons, but I think if we're using device alone, um, only the iPhone Pro model has it, and that isn't the high volume of the phone market. And I think... Um, 
one of Google's top of the line flagships has it as well. Okay. So, All right, and your local police station may have it. I won't tell you how I know they, that. They definitely do. <laughs> oh, but I, now I you want to know. Yeah, I got schooled on. No, 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 it's not radar. We caught you on LIDAR. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. And LIDAR, Actually, LIDAR is really, really hard to uh, pick up on a detector. Um, and it's also very fast. So, yeah. Yeah, LIDAR is where a lot of the municipalities have gone to. You know, another cool thing you can do with LIDAR is you can walk into a completely pitch dark room and through watching through the phone, it's like night vision. You can see the whole room. I mean, all you can just turn the Yay. Or you can just turn the light on. It's just an either one. Oh, but <laughs> but again, Lauren, all, like, what is he walking enough, around in the Lauren, Lauren dark with a phone the, in front of you is the, way more cool than turning a light on. I'm just, Lauren I'm is the modern the day <laughs> Rube Goldberg. Like... <laughs> Why do anything the simple way? Let's no. just let's. If you can make it more difficult, but use three tools. Right. Well, just, just, more... just ask I mean, my wife yeah. about why all of our lights require us to ask them to turn on. Just and if you don't say please, they flicker. <laughs> Doesn't well, happen. It's really, hard, it's really hard to stalk people when you turn the lights on. They notice. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you've got lidar. Yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> See. And I did learn something about Google Assistant. When you do have a power failure and it does lose connection with all of your smart light bulbs, all the smart light bulbs just flash. So when you come home and your uh, your, your apartment or your condo looks like a disco, it's because your, your Google <laughs> Assistant went off. That's something I learned, just whether you can use that or not. <laughs> you know, anyway, Lily, great did, to have uh, you here. Did we talk about um, the Pebblebrook announcement? No, we, we did not. No, do we want to talk about that? Absolutely. It's yeah. massive. So, yeah, well, I think it's I think you're going to see more of this. So, yeah. uh, let me uh, pull up a link so we all have it. Pebblebrook announced a soft brand uh, that they are creating. And uh, it's a it's a pretty big deal. Uh, let's see here, Pebblebrook. So, so let's talk about who who was involved with this too, because yeah, I think mean, you have well, a lot here. of big soft brand players out there, right? So you had your benchmark I saw was in there. Uh, there's Viceroy, good, yeah, Viceroy, uh, Provenance, yeah. So th this is this is a big threat to some of the established soft brands. I mean, it, it's it's a huge indication of the direction that this industry could potentially head. Oh, good, Ben. Ben really got it up. So, yeah, good job, Ben. So, you know, I, I think, um, I, I actually think this is Pebblebrook taking a look at what SVC recently did with their Sinesta uh, moves. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've talked about the SVC uh, move a couple of times where uh, SVC a few years ago bought a uh, stake in Sinesta Hotels. Uh, and then with what's going on with COVID, use the opportunity where IHG and Marriott were both uh, in violation of their performance guarantees with SVC. So SVC moved a total of 240-ish hotels off of IHG and Marriott and onto Sinesta, which now basically means SVC owns Sinesta for all intents and purposes. Um, I think when you look at what Pebble, uh, Pebblebrook is doing with their move of curator hotels and resorts um, is, first of all, partnering with really smart operators. You have Noble House, you have Benchmark, you have Davidson, um, all in all not only involved in this, but some of them like took part in investing in the, uh, the actual uh, soft brand. And then when you really look at what they laid out as the reasons to join as an owner, um, you know, they're really going after what's going to speak to hotel owners, which is flexibility, but getting the benefits, um, you know, low, low cost compared to going with a curio or a uh, autograph. And, and if I'm Marriott, Hilton, you know, any of these groups, I actually would be worried about this because when you look at Pebble Brooks uh, collection of hotels, they have some iconic Hyatt and Starwood Marriott properties that fit the mold of this curator collection um, 
that they're putting together. And they're, they're saying that they're aiming for 100 hotels uh, to be part of this soft brand by uh, the end of next year and another 100 hotels behind that, which again, if you look at just Pebble Brook, <laughs> I'd be worried if I was you know, their, uh, their relationship manager uh, with any of the brands that they currently have flags on, because I'm guessing a lot of brands are in a point of weakness right now on their contractual lock-ins uh, that they have. Yeah. yeah. And well, I think I'm oh, sorry. I see. Let's see what happens too is with a lot of your soft brands, like an autograph or whatever, pick your favorite. I'm not picking on any one of them by any means, but what tends to happen is that they're an indie, a pseudo independent hotel that is part of a brand. Well, the brand focus is on the brand. You just happen to be tagging along and getting some of the fringe benefits, the tech stack, uh, some of the marketing and so forth. Whereas this is a soft brand that is all about independent hotels and it's more focused on those independent groups. They don't have a brand. I mean, there's a brand identity with it, which is going to be valuable for them, but they're not focused on that. They're focused on being independent. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting that, you know, they've essentially gone into this with management company partners. Like, here, mm -hmm. is, here are your choices, right? I don't think that there's going to be an option maybe to not work with one of these management companies if you flag as one of these soft brands. So it's kind of a an interesting, like, mix up of ownership and management company, which probably helps Pebblebrook with some of the re related restrictions that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they've obviously had relationships with these management companies over the years, and they've kind of already started in this direction, I feel like with, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, what we affectionately refer to as the Z collection in San Francisco, right? So they've got Zeta and Zeppelin and um, all of these different Zephyr, and they're between different management companies there already, some of these that have been named, um, but they all follow kind of similarities. And even those that don't, like when we visited their properties that are maybe actually branded, even still there, they've brought in their concept of a game room which is a huge thing. Like you can almost tell that you're in a Pebble Brook hotel if they have a really robust game room. That's a thing that they like to offer. So I think they've sort of been, you know, whether they did it intentionally early on and then, you know, this is the end result or whether they kind of dabbled in it and then found opportunity this year. I think that they've really laid the foundation for this well over the last several years. And again, to Dean's point about the soft, the the independent hotel focus, I think uh, preferred hotels should be seriously concerned because uh, preferred has been a halfway house. <laughs> I mean, they diluted their brand strata. They've they fractured it just to be inclusive. They've they've softened their requirements for people. To, they, I mean, you can't if you go down to preferred side to me. Frustratingly, it used to be there was three levels basically: bronze, gold, platinum, whatever they used to call initially themselves. Now it's all fuzzy names. There's no real way to determine uh, what what level each of the hotels are so that they can be inclusive. So I think probably in some way, if they maintain their strata of demand for what the property should be, then they'll be fine. If they start diluting it to become accepting of other properties that may not be of the same criteria as other hotels, they're going to follow down the same wrong path that some of these other places have, have ventured. Like yeah, I, don't, I don't think preferred are going to be as scared as Marriott's and no, no, no. And I, mean, I think they should be in addition to everybody we just talked about. Yeah. But but what's likely going to happen, I think we're going to see a trend. One of the criticisms of the brands, and not every brand, some have done better than others, is, it, you know, because they, they laid off a lot of people, they become really unagile, right? They're very stuck and, and mired in protocol and process, and they haven't they haven't been able to be flexible. And, and that's why they're pushing this, this flexibility promise with this new brand, because in, you pick the, the three or four hotels you know have done the best through this pandemic. And every one of them, I guarantee, has the same characteristic, which is they've been really good at being agile. They've figured new things out and tried them really quickly, and they've found some success doing that. You can't yeah. do that with a flag right now. You couldn't even, for the longest time, you couldn't even update your own website, the corporate website, with covid related information it was locked down for a lot of brands so if you're sitting there knowing you now have a legal out from this contract that is usually very watertight 
in looking and saying, hey, these guys are jumping it. They're deflagging. I mean, yeah, they're going soft brand, but they're really deflagging. Someone like Preferred is going to probably benefit from that a little bit too because there's going to be other people looking for different options, right? Maybe this isn't right for them, but maybe Preferred is. So I think you're right. Some people will leave Preferred, but they'll probably benefit more from people deflagging and going to someone like that. And, and that's really what I think they're probably going after. If you think about the fact that it's Pebble Brook leading the charge here, I have to imagine they're smart enough to know that if they really want this to kill, then they need relationships with finance. Mm -hmm. You know, they need to yeah. be able to get it to where you can have a hotel financed and still be a curator. Um, and with Pebble Brook being, you know, the masterminds behind this, they have financial relationships. And mm. so I, you know, and if they, if that is part of this, that is where they'll have a leg up on a preferred. That's where they'll have yeah. a leg up on any of these uh, traditional soft brands, leading hotels, things like that, that are more, you know, sales like related yeah. and GDS chain code, um, you know, if they if they take this and get a financial part of it, this is a real shot at Curio. This is a real shot at Autograph um, and, and, you know, Best Western and Wyndham and all these companies that have come up with yeah. that soft brand. Personally, being a big fan of independent hotels, like I'm like, yay. Uh, I love mm -hmm. these soft brands that allow hotels to have like more identity and more interest to them it's still i think meets the criteria of you know what i like to look at as the business traveler profile you want to know exactly what you're getting but i think the the proliferation of airbnb in and of itself tells you that the market is hungry for more unique and authentic experiences now that may not necessarily mean that they want to stay in an Airbnb, but some people may be doing that simply because they feel like they can't get that experience elsewhere. But when you talk about like a preferred and a curator, right? So let's just kind of look at the pros and cons here. If you are comfortable with saying, I have this, you know, whatever it was, five or six management companies to choose from, I have to go with one of them. I want this strong ownership group behind me, you know, that type of thing, then curator is a great fit. Whereas others who may not, you know, I don't want the cost of a management company to be kind of factored in here. I don't want this or that. Bye, Ben. Um, hey, buddy all of those types of things, then preferred allows a lot more flexibility because your average mom and pop, as long as they meet, you know, certain criteria, which I agree have become a little bit more fuzzy over the years, um, can go with preferred, still have a type of representation, but not have to change the name of their hotel or, or do, do certain things. What I don't see in here that I'm really curious about though is um, what type of PIP requirements are they going to have for hotels coming into the brand? And what does the fee structure look like in order to be part of the soft brand, which I'm sure will develop in their, over time. In their press release, they, they do talk about the structure of cost being more aggressive than all the other choices um, and the structure of commitment also being more flexible, uh, which obviously we all know that's the start. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, over time, over Let's time. Get Remember yeah. Hotel Tonight's initial commission? Yeah. It, it was super low. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I think this isn't the last you're going to see of this. Um, I think because of how the brands um, handled uh, COVID, I think they left themselves open to actions like this, actions like Sinesta has taken with SVC, and I'm, I'm willing to bet you Sinesta's gotten phone calls from other portfolio owners going, how did SVC do this? And you know, mm -hmm. what's your structure? Why did they pick you? Um, because like the, the IHG one, I think we all looked at the initial kind of shot as, oh, is IHG really going to let that portfolio walk away? And then watched in shock as they did. And then if you look at how fast the Marriott one went, um, that's really there were some windows in there too. Yeah. Yeah, that didn't get as much coverage though. Yeah. Right. I mean but, but there were the, some flagship window ones that went. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if I'm if I'm uh the the person at Hyatt or Marriott or Hilton that manages Pebblebrook's relationship, I'm 
I'm concerned because when you look at Pebble Brook's uh, collection of W's, their collection of curios and autographs, these are, you know, like key flags in key cities. Oh, and Kimpton. That's the other thing. You know, Pebble Brook owns a lot of the good remaining Kimptons, the Monaco's and things like that. Um, Yeah, it's this is an interesting move and it'll be interesting to see what the likes of like Ashford does. Right, because think it, about it, them. I think it becomes interesting too. I, I'm not a fan of loyalty programs, uh, but they are one of the big advantages that brands will tout over independents. And it's hard for a small group of independents, even somebody like a benchmark, who's got quite a few of them, right? But still, you don't have 6,000 of them. Right. And so yeah. it, it's really hard for a 30 hotel group to have a loyalty program. Uh, but now, if you have something like this, and they can come together and they have a sizable, footprint and you can probably find at least one in every major city maybe more now that becomes interesting mm-hmm. i think you know i immediately went to the loyalty program too dean i was yeah. just going to comment on that as well um i think first of all to uh to kind of your point ed major cities are maybe not going to be their first target if uh they want their hotels to perform <laughs> right now maybe in six months or so um but i think also like with the loyalty programs i feel like there's a shift that has been needed for some time because now it's kind of just obligatory like great i'm just in every i'm a card carrying member of every loyalty program there's no true loyalty you're just adding up points when it's convenient to your stay to happen to be at that brand i really don't believe like there are some hardcore loyalists out there for sure but i think it it's maybe like 20 percent at most of all of the loyalty card well it's it's a thing less yeah, yeah it, and all it is, is, it's not even real loyalty. It's just gaming point systems to get discounts, right? right? Yeah. I mean, it's a frequency so program. Like, Once you get status, you do like it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the people that yeah. were racking up the points aren't traveling right now. Because right. it was most yeah. business right. road yeah. you know? Like, I think that there's been a need maybe for a more personalized type of loyalty program. And actually Kimpton's original before they were with IHG was probably the closest to this that I've ever seen. Um, But I might be more inclined to stay with a hotel brand that I feel like they know me. So when I make my reservation, things are going to be automatically tailored to my preferences before I even arrive. And I don't think there's any brand that's done a really fantastic job of that. You know, you have to have some, maybe some technology in place, sort of like a CRM or a, a guestware of some sort, some sort of customer relationship management software well, in order to understand that and you, really keep track of it. You also, you have, you have to productize the offering as well to create right. consistency. So that's where you're getting into, you know, what's on hand, what, you know, what really can be offered because right, and then the yeah yeah you yeah want to promise it and not deliver it exactly exactly yeah are there, are there things really specifically that would would benefit because you hear people theoretically talking about okay we're going to set the temperature to your preferred temperature in the room or turn the lights to the right level but but to me there's not tangible preferences i have that there's perks i want right i'd love to have early check-in and late checkout and maybe a member only discount and maybe a discount at, at the food and beverage on property. There are perks. What's your favorite drink? Right, right. Well, but yes, I can tell the bartender. But if there's like for my hangover and I'm, I'm good to go, you know, there's, there's all these little things that you can do though, when it comes to that. I mean, if you, if they start to establish a pattern, like, Hey, they always charge an old fashioned to their room. And then you go to some Mm -hmm. bar where maybe that's not on the menu, but they put an old fashioned cocktail, like mixer set in your room or something, you know, they automatically include one at check-in. Here's a coupon for your first old fashioned or little things that recognize like, Hey, we're paying attention and we care about what you care about. For me, it would probably be like three (laughs) gallons of water in my room so Mm -hmm. I can refill my personal water bottle that I prefer to use. They would know that I prefer like a big gallon that I can use versus like a bazillion plastic water bottles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think they have a portable distillery for me yet, but it'd be a great idea for them to, you know. There's a keg. <laughs> <in this. laughs> 
Did this hook you up to an IV with pure alcohol as soon as you walk well, in? The just, you know, you know. <laughs> nurse says, hello, welcome here. here you go. Um, See, uh, for Lauren, all they would need to do is put on the television set any possible app sumo app that they could <laughs> load on the like, TV set. And Lauren would be like, like, all right, uh, you won. Uh, yeah. I'm I put a green screen in his room. He'll be, he'll be happy. <laughs> I, yeah, you have me. You have me at hello, but I guess it it actually touches on something else. You you talk about how loyalty program has been defined up to this point, and it's been about a frequency and carrot on a stick or whatever you know. And what you're talking about is something that maybe eventually we can evolve into. And it's not so much about um, us signing up because we're just signing up to everything. It's recognizing the value of who they might be based on on their proximity on their travel interest or what have you, and giving them a value proposition that is meaningful to them because you have great CRM or that you have a uh, great research about them to give them some without being spooky um, about something that might be of value to them for coming into the market. Like here's a great guide to the local Korean restaurants. Cause from what we look like, you know, you love Korean food. How do you and know so that about me, Lauren? It's just something I follow you on, stalk you, shadow, whatever, whatever we, ghosting, whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> but the idea of it that you share that kind of information in a meaningful way to them so that they're like, oh, well, this is pretty cool that they're paying, to your point, really, uh, focused attention on me. And it isn't yeah. always necessarily the discount or something, but it can be the perk to like Stuart said. It can be something that says, oh, that's pretty cool. I appreciate you're going to give me an early checkout or a chicken, you know, or a late checkout, you know. It's risky, right? It's fraught. But I mean, one, one there's an oogie line that you can cross where, where you're spying on someone and then they're like, why are you, how are you inferring this? Or why do you know this about me, right? That, that you've got to be careful. You don't cross cross a line there looking at what their or receipts are. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's kind of, I, I would have some concerns with that. But the, the more important one is, can can you execute it effectively consistently? Because if you can't, <clears throat> Worse off trying it than not trying yes. it because it, the worst true. thing you can do is promise something and not deliver. It's it's. I think it was Bill Burr did that bit a long time ago when Wi-Fi started appearing on um, on airplanes and how how the first time he, or it was the second time he'd been on a plane with Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi went out and he was like livid like how this is unacceptable. It's like this is something you only just got like two days ago for the first time ever <laughs> and now it's unacceptable <laughs> that it doesn't work right so. You've got to be really careful that you can deliver on your promises. I think starting simple, right? And not necessarily getting ultra, ultra personalized, but just making people feel special doesn't need to be about them being specifically special. It's just you're treating them a little better than they expect. And and so it, right. it is things like early checking and late checkout, like I said. So, the, the yeah, I, I totally community. agree. I think like there's... There's this kind of like pie in the sky, like where we maybe eventually want to go. And I think sometimes hospitality companies and other companies, to be fair, like, like we're not there yet. So how can we possibly do this until we have everything perfect? We can't get yeah. there. So I think it's about progress and adding like little pieces at a time to your point, Stuart. Like what can we execute on well right now? Let's build it around that and then figure yeah. out what we can execute well, next. Yeah. I don't need the personally curated artwork in the room yet, right? Let's, right. let's figure out how the basics work. It depends work. how much you're paying the, for that room. Yeah. Yeah. The paying universal 1500 amenity, probably do that. The universal amenity that everybody can do for, for a loyalty member though is a room upgrade. You don't have to spy on me and read my receipts to know that I like this or that. Upgrade my room and I'm a happy guy, right? But and there that's better be something like interesting about that upgrade. Like, don't take me from a classic to a deluxe that's like 20 more square feet and then try to make a big deal about how oh, it's yeah. an upgrade. Oh, yeah. Make sure that I can tell the difference. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If it's just that. But, you know, most hotels, even a limited service hotel, probably has a suite somewhere in the hotel. Not all, but most of them do. Right. Uh, again, you can't upgrade every single person, uh, but when you do upgrade somebody, I tell you what, once they get that taste and they start liking that, even think about airlines. I used to fly, I was a platinum, I lived in Dallas, so I was platinum, whatever the heck it was with American, and I got my upgrades. Boy, I missed those when I was no longer platinum. <laughs> so yeah. once you start getting that, you miss it, right? Yeah, and but you've got to be careful, right? It can backfire. So I used yeah. to do that with... When I was lived in England and, and would visit, my wife is from America, and I flew back and forward a few times while we dated for a year, and I would always book British Airways. It cost a little bit more, but I knew that there was a hack to the system. If I showed up a, about an hour before everyone else did the check-in and I was wearing you know, business-looking clothes, 
nine out of 10, I would get a free upgrade to business class. And it wouldn't cost me a penny. I'd, I'd buy coach, I'd get a free upgrade to business class. And I loved it. And I would pay more for British Airways just because I knew that would happen. And then all of a sudden they stopped that policy. I've not flown British Airways once since that happened. <laughs> yeah, well, this is the same thing with the suite, right? So even a, sl a select service hotel that has one suite, but you have 10 loyalty members. Well, last time I got a suite, why why can't you upgrade? You know, I, yeah. I think you have to be really careful kind of to store your point about consistency, right? The right. as soon as, I mean, we've all thrown. Things able to do every time. Yeah, where the Wi-Fi doesn't work or we've all, you know, where, yeah, I don't get my upgrades. If I know it's a, so I flew a lot on Alaska for the same reason. I, I shoot i flew to hawaii last year I was on eight flights i got upgraded seven times so um and i wasn't mad for it because i knew it wasn't a guarantee i knew it was a right you know yeah. hey based on your status and if you're lucky but yeah of course i'm gonna spend a couple extra bucks and fly alaska because but to your point Stuart, i knew the chances of me getting upgraded were good but i think if you, you have to be careful on the hotel front to set that expectation. I mean, I'm part of loyalty programs where I'm a high enough level that you get the upgrades. And I don't think I've ever gotten an upgrade unless I knew the person at the hotel and they were kind mm -hmm. of yeah. <laughs> Actually, I only, I only ever get upgraded at a hotel when I'm traveling alone. It's never when I'm with my family or <laughs> any of that stuff. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Never. You know, there are certain commonalities. That there's certain commonalities that you can do that you you can make them feel special, but do it for everybody. You know, uh, there was a small little hotel I had in Virginia that we did this to everybody that checked in. We had this really neat local confectioner's chocolate box. And now you just think it's a room amenity, but we put it in every arrival. But what we did do was every arrival got a personal card from the GM at the desk. So we didn't have to worry about trying to run in front of the room and drop it in the room before they arrived. And we just said, I hope you enjoy a small gift to you when you arrive into the room. They, for no other reason, even if they were traveling with other people and say, hey, I got these. Oh, so did I. They still thought they were special compared to anybody else because really at the end of the day, everybody was getting it. But that little extra thing of as an acknowledgement for thank you for staying with us, as standard as it was, felt made them feel very unique. And then I wonder, and this is a technical question for Stuart, eventually in time, if we have them connect to the internet and we see that they're searching for restaurants or types of restaurants or something, is it? truly pervasive to then offer to them that we have a discount at a certain restaurant type that they were interested in looking at? Would that be spooky? Depends how it's presented, right? I think if it's- Hey, we saw you were looking at green porn. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that-, that. I All think right, it's like back on different. track. This is Lily coming in. <laughs> Maybe too far. Okay, that's too far. It's like a little Ted movie. Okay, that's too much. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, probably no, the I line think, there. Like somewhere. the best way that you can do it is when it feels like it was accidental. No, yeah. I just, dis I just, dis it, it either needs to feel completely accidental or it's incredibly clear why you're suggesting this to me. Yeah. And it, anything in between, you run the risk of it being super creepy. Fair enough. Yeah, and even being clear, I think, is risky after the fact, right? If, if someone's on your site and looks at the page and you're tracking that and then you track that through the CRM and, and you can you can bubble that data up to, to make the decision, telling someone after the fact that's the level that you were tracking, I don't think is ever a good idea. No. I think that, that, no. That's a risk. If up front they start searching for Korean restaurants, Lauren, restaurants, Korean, then... Uh. And then you say, hey, do you mind if we save this information so that when you stay with us, we can provide a free coupon? Being transparent up front, that's totally I like okay. That. I like that. I think that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. It feels less magical to me, just on a personal level. It is. To pull off magical, you need to be yeah. incredibly thoughtful. Yeah. And because yeah. of that caveat, I highly recommend that any of our listeners do not try to pull off magical because the thoughtfulness that's required to do it to where it will not be creepy. You're more likely to not be able to pull that off at scale 
than you mm-hmm. are to be able to. Wait, Ed, are well, we I'm, supposed I'm, to be be able to give like practical advice on this show? I yes. thought we were just here to debate what? like utopias. No, yeah, yeah. Talk about hypotheticals and let them figure I'm, it out. Right, hypothetical yeah. happinesses, folks. Come on, nothing practical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think we're going like you want to think about the the impact that each thing is going to have, though, right? Because as we're coming up on the holidays, there's a reason that you didn't grow up with a bunch of envelopes with gift cards under your tree, which is essentially what giving you know, a discount. Because they're the worst gift you can give someone. Exactly. They're so not thoughtful. Because that's exactly what, like, essentially an upgrade is, oh, let me give you something for free. It may or may not apply to your stay, but I'm just giving you monetary value. <laughs> giving them a discount is giving them monetary value. Putting an amenity in the room, to Lauren's point, feels much more special it feels more like a thoughtful gift and i also don't think that it's like if you want to do this then you get into like the back and forth oh but what if they're allergic to chocolate what if they don't eat sugar you know there's so many things right now i don't think there's anything wrong and you can even use this as a direct booking incentive to say hey in the spirit of hospitality, we want to make you feel as comfortable with your stay as possible. It sounded like Please you said choose. less comfortable. <laughs> less comfortable. It, it did sound like you said less comfortable. I'm just going to put that out well, there. Well, maybe if you just listen more. At that, <laughs> um, but we want you to be as comfortable as possible. So here is your choice of six different things. You yep. know, it could be a, a and group I've seen play, a couple of hotels do that. Yeah. Do it yeah. with like and every then, single check-in. Yeah. It or costs maybe- less. Are there anything you wouldn't want, right? Like, hey, I, you know, because, you know, we, we said sugar, drink like preferences. Like, yeah. I like, I mean, I'm not a big, you know, I drink occasionally, but I'm not a big drinker. So if someone puts a bottle How of wine in, in this room, I know, I am a weirdo. Um, I but quit alcohol. Too. Wine in my room, it's not, honestly. You think that's coffee Lily's drinking? Oh. Really? <laughs> <laughs> now Sorry. put a six pack of diet coke in the fridge and i'm good to go um but that's what I, I think and you made a really good point right for a lot of the hoteliers out there trying to do this i think is really challenging if for no other reason than everyone has different preferences mm-hmm. i'm of the opinion if i'm only in your hotel for less than three days don't i don't want you cleaning my room i've got the do not disturb on i'm, I'm oh, not a busy person that's who you it know, is alone. i just want to go in out and do what I need to do. That, I want to late checkout so that my family can hang out and sleep in in the morning on our last day. But like for us, it's mostly let it leave us alone. Let us just kind of yeah. be. It. I need something. It's about I, individual choice, right? Yep. It's about preference. Mm-hmm. Like to the Lily's point, giving people, hey, you can have this or this or this. That makes me feel special, and it feels personalized, and it's not oogie, right? It checks all the boxes. We know that people, different people want different levels of cleaning right now, depending on where they are. Like we talked about earlier, everyone's at a different point of recovery with, with COVID. Some people want daily extra housekeeping. Some people just want new towels. Some people don't want to be touched, you know, and giving people the choice that, I mean, operationally, it's, it can be a little complex, but it can save you a ton of money because now you're not turning room or cleaning rooms and making beds every day. So the ones I love honest, like- is a, a loft. Um, right. did that really well where they gave you a card that said, hey, if you choose not to have housekeeping, here's a, a $5 credit per day to use at our breakfast and things yeah. like that. That was all of Starwood. I loved yeah. that. Dan Destin did it better because it was alcohol related. So they gave you two two tickets per day for any drink at the bar. That, yeah, I mean, which is I amazing. housekeeping for like the next 12 years for that. that yeah. I mean, <laughs> <there's no laughs> Good, bring up, good point about right, one other. I gotta run. Sometimes. Have a good oh, weekend. Yeah. Oh, Ed, take care. Happy Thanks, Thanksgiving. Bye. Yep. Happy. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes these questions. I mean, there's some platforms, nameless as they may, because I, I find them to be invasive, are offering you incentives to book to make that conversion. Like we're going to give you this, we're going to give you this if you book, and so forth. I think that there's a value proposition. I wish Ben was still with us today, or Tris, one of the two. And we can always ask them when they pop back on the show of offering it after the booking through the pre-arrival process of saying, oh, yeah. to your point, what is it that you would like to enhance your stay with us? Because all honesty, there is no reason in the world, every hotel, if they have tiers of Wi-Fi, we know from steward surveys, Wi-Fi is bread and butter. You can't tell them, do you want your water hotter or colder, which is the one just above it. <laughs> but you know, the idea of having the ultimate Wi-Fi, even if you don't plan on using for business, just having better. Everyone likes better. They don't like, I'm good. I want better. And so offering them better as a variable to after they've booked, 
And I think Melissa pointed out, you know, the direct booking, especially if you're going to enhance the value of people booking directly with you, making this their first, you know, they're, they're the first ones to receive this option. Like, hey, and then, of course, not to deter from those that didn't book direct with you. We'd love for you to book direct with us again. Should we be able to get your email or means of communicating with you? Can we give you this value proposition for that offer? You know, yeah. and, use and it that not, way. not all things are made equally, right? There's certain things that you can do that are surprise and delight that have a massive effect. And you brought up Melissa. She recently stayed at a Kempton in Asheville and it's a pet friendly property. And they, they knew that she was coming with a pet because you book and you pay a little extra if you're staying with a pet. So at check-in, she got two little doggy biscuits and a coupon to go to a local doggy bakery, right? So every guest that comes with a dog or with a pet gets that. And if you don't have a pet, you don't get it, right? That, that's, that's really simple. You don't have to choose anything beforehand. It's surprise and delight. That's great. But then there's certain things like maybe breakfast that I might want to include during the booking process because it's a conscious decision yes. I'm making about the, the yes. value, right? I'm not but saying there's another or at the end. Right. It's, 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 it's an additive thing. Right. But then there's other things which are like new choices that should never be done before the booking. They should be done after the booking in the arrival messages like room upgrades, because something like a room upgrade can drive tremendous more uh, like greater revenue. Once someone's already made the initial commitment, once they've already committed that five hundred thousand dollars or whatever to tell them they're only going to spend an extra hundred or two hundred on a room upgrade psychologically is a lot easier for them than, than coughing up the entire money up front. So I think you've got to be really um, deliberate about what it is, you're, what the value is you're providing and where you introduce it in the, in the journey of the guest. And, mm -hmm. and you know, of course, I'm, I'm all about the meta search. And I tell you what, with meta search booking, do not get that process convoluted by any extras. Get the booking first. I am a big proponent of not putting any, don't offer an upgrade, don't do all of those things. Get the booking and then offer all the extras in there. Because every step of the way, you're losing a conversion on that. You know, it's funny you bring this up. I remember very specifically when I finally convinced Renee to travel with me when I was going back and forth to Shanghai. We were staying at the Renaissance and we probably got the poor guy fired. Um, so we go up to the front desk and we're just staying Not normally. Much. And while he goes over and he, first off, he did excellent English. And he's like, you know, we have this upgrade to our concierge level for X number of, uh, of monies more. And we met, did the math real quick and it was pretty cheap. It was what's included with the, with the concierge level. Oh, you get free food and free drinks. And we started calculating what all that would be. And we're like, huh, sounds like, and plus we get a room upgrade. And we're like, wow, this is really great. We didn't eat hardly anywhere else for the entire stay we were there, except for a few places when we were out and about during the day. We came back to have dinner at that place where we got to eat for free and drinks, which is why we probably got the guy fired because he's like, why'd you give this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you went there four hours, you get out of here. Um, <laughs> but again, it, we wouldn't have made that choice in the booking process going over because we really didn't know the value proposition what it was. Once we got there and we're seeing what we had and what we were thinking about, this now turned into a viable, like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. We should do that. Uh, so, yes, I believe there is stages of what gets offered. And Stuart, to your point, there are some things, yes, I just want to alleviate that problem. I want breakfast. Yes, add that in there. Get that done. You know, I want, you know, if you give me a discount for food towards it for lunch or whatever, sure. Yeah, I'm, based on what I know I'm going to be doing for my travels, that works out great for me. If I know I'm going to be gone the whole day, no big deal. I don't need it. So, yes. And then by the same token, there's value incentives afterwards that you can offer that I think would be more reasonable to listen to after, to Dean's point, I've made the booking, I'm coming there. Now you're telling me I can get these other things. Sure. Yeah, and, and I will say too, you know, we, we have a booking engine product and, and it has an additional services module. So during the booking process, you can, you can add certain things. And we've done a lot of testing. You know, we love to test, we love the, the, the data side of stuff. And there's this conventional wisdom in the, in the industry or in marketing in general, that every click you add reduces the number of conversions, right? Which, which is mostly true. But when you look at the net result, we, we tested this thoroughly, depending on what you're offering, you, you can end up with more, same number of bookings, but a lot more revenue by having those prior to booking, depending on what they are. Room upgrades aren't that effective pre-booking. They're, they're more effective after booking. But like I said, sure. breakfast, some, some other add-ons like little niceties or even free stuff like we, we we've done things where you can select to to get a free coupon book for the local area and things like that and that can actually improve conversion rate because people start and saying oh i don't get that on the otas i'm more likely to book with you now because you're adding value 
that the OTAs don't. So so I, th I think we need to be careful not just to assume because there's more in the way that we're automatically going to get less bookings. The data doesn't suggest that's the case always. That being said, there is a limit, right? So I'm going to use a non-hospitality <laughs> example here. Why we test it. Yeah, so uh, Pet Lab offers a variety of different like treats for dogs that are for different health things. So I wanted to try out some of these. I had already made my decision. I went on and I went to order it. Wait, right? were they for you or for your pet? A little bit of both. Okay. <laughs> I want to, I like to sample everything myself. Now. Uh, not so, good for you, not good for the dog. That's how I look. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I went on, right. I ordered and then it was like, Oh, but wait, like, do you want to add more for a discount? okay, sure, no problem. And then it said, oh, but do you want to also add this other product, which, you know, here's this special offer. And I'm like, okay, she was a little annoying, but, you know, I don't really want this. So anyway, continue. It did three more of those yeah. before it allowed me to pay. I almost abandoned the cart. If I wasn't yep. like, if I hadn't had Enough. it in my mind already that I was like, I'm definitely wanting to buy this. I would not have made it through that checkout process. It's so a typical, but wait, like, there's more. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, no. Right, but yeah. one, is, one is fine. Two yeah, is yeah. okay. Like beyond that, you're like, can you just let me you're pay you? Taking a at that point. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. also, we, we let's not discount the human factor of this opportunity. And I say this particularly for somebody I was very impressed with, front desk person that I arrived and this was going to New York and not, I mean, I didn't look for the exterior of the building or how big of a footprint it has something. And the place had 44 floors <laughs> and I get there at the front desk and, and, and I'm at the time my knee was giving me heck. So I was kind of hobbling in. Um, and as I'm there, I'm looking at the elevator and people are waiting to get on the elevator. This is before COVID, obviously waiting to get on the elevator. The elevator is full of people coming out. People are waiting to get on. And I'm sitting there, I'm looking at it and the front desk person watching me having walked in, and looking at me, look at the elevator, he says, I can put you on a lower floor so you don't have to fight the elevator so much. I'm like, thank you. Because that was being sensitive to just literally me just staring at the elevator going, wow, it's, I got to factor in. I got to add another 15 minutes of travel time from whatever floor you're putting me on before I get back downstairs again. And the person was kind enough to look at it that way. And just, you know, and so there is that factor at the front desk where you can see somebody and be like, you look pretty hungry. I mean, we're closed right now, but you know, there's a really cool restaurant in the corner we happen to have this discount available for. Or, you know, um, bars open if you just want to chill while you, you know, especially if there's any delay factor in the room. That kind of personalization, like, you know what, we're going to make you wait a little bit because the room's not ready, but you know what, I'm going to move you up to a better room. There's a word for that. What is it? What is that word? Um, oh, 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 oh it's with an H, right? I think. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I, I have to know, though, Lauren, what does a hungry person look like? Oh, me. <laughs> <laughs> like this? <laughs> Especially if they're eating something, you know, you're just looking at going, you want to finish that? <laughs> <laughs> you hear the Can I have one of those room? fries, front desk agents? Yeah. <laughs> you gonna eat, you going to eat all those? Is it you done? <laughs> yeah, or you're you staring at the restaurant not, menus, yeah. Overdoing it, right? But I, I don't know if you, any of you guys have used the Walmart shopping app. We, we Oh we yes, almost always pick do Walmart pickup now, right? And they have yep. this brilliant thing at the end of the process because every time I'll go through and add all the things to the cart for my favorites, and then I go go to checkout, and the window that comes up is these are the items you usually buy that aren't in your cart right now. Are there any that you'd like to add? And every single time, there's at least three things that I'm like, oh yeah, yeah I could use those again. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. a much different mentality as well too. Because remember, at that stage of the game, you've just spent. 15, 20 minutes adding all of this crap into your car. You've got your whole shopping list that you've added into there. So at this point, interrupting that purchasing process, it's not like you're just going to abandon it at that point in time because you've got one more item they're talking about. You're like, oh, yeah, okay. So you're committed at that stage of the game. Whereas mm -hmm. when we talk about a hotel buying one item, I always think of it, I gauge it by the, the old question, what would Amazon do, right? Yeah. And Amazon's going to get you through that purchasing process as quickly and efficiently as possible, you click one button, and the next thing you know, you just bought the VHS box set of Mash, and you're like, "What the <laughs> hell am I going to do with this?" You don't, but who cares? You buy, right? Because yeah. they made it so easy, and, and that's the way to you want that booking process to be. You want them to be able to go through that click, but, click, but click to, to a degree. I, I don't know if I fully agree though, because we we did some experimentation too on what the, the Amazon shopping cart experience strips out the navigation, right? 
And, and so a lot of booking engines think that that's the way to do it because it's the way Amazon works. But when you really think about the, yes, it's a simple transaction, but it's a very thoughtful transaction, a hotel, especially if it's not like a last minute on a mobile device kind of booking. If we're looking at, I'm booking my week long vacation for my family or my, my honeymoon or whatever, I, I'm bouncing around, I'm researching, I'm looking at multiple sites, I'm comparing things on the OTAs and this site and the, and the hotel next door. I'm not just going through a linear path. It's a very circular and, and convoluted path. So taking what we found is people get into the booking engine for the first time, then jump out and look at the accommodations page or the amenities page, and then leave the site for a while and go compare prices and then come back. Maybe um, go to triple prices. You've got to make sure your mousetrap has all the answers, right? You try well, to prevent people from leaving by putting them. Remember from MetaSearch, they've already done all those things, right? So on MetaSearch, they've already done this rate comparison, they've looked at the reviews, they've looked at the picture, Maybe. they clicked a button that said book, they want to do one thing right there, and that is book a reservation. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 okay, people I'll, I'll spend I'll a lot of time on the site when they come from Medicine. I'll, I'll add another layer to this, and I'm doing something different. You know how we talk about retargeting, and, and we've talked about frequency of retargeting based on the uh, booking window. Obviously, the farther out, the frequency is a little bit more patterned and stretched out because you're trying to retarget them over a period of time compared to a short booking window of interest. You know, three to five days out, you're going to hammer them a little bit more frequently between now and that time because, you know, you have a limited window of exposure. The same rationale goes to just because somebody booked two weeks, three weeks out from the reservation, you don't have that sealed deal. That's not a done deal. That's okay. a, I got it booked. But I also may have booked in two or three other places, especially, and I learned this from the New York side of things, they're terrible about that. I mean, back in the day before all of COVID hit, you you would have terrible cancellation percentages because people will mass book and then purge before they decided where they're going to stay. I blame Robert so, Cole. He was the one that told everyone to do that. It's his fault. Yeah, well, it is his fault, and it's true. Uh, so you have to actually enhance the value proposition of why, after they booked with you, use that ability to reach out to them to reinforce the value of what you are in comparison to others. That's when you start need to start feeding them your proximity information. That's when you start need to feeding them your amenity information to really validate the fact that you're the better preference than compared to possibly what else they've ever done. And even if they haven't booked elsewhere and just booked you, it's reaffirmational. So mm -hmm. that by the time they may go back and re-question, to your point, Stuart, they're looking at it from the comparison of, of I've already gotten comfortable with this decision. I'm comfortable mm -hmm. with the additional information that's been given to me, so I'm going to stay with them. Yeah, you, do, you want to make sure you don't tap into – everyone has a little buyer's remorse whenever they spend money, right? And, and so you want to make sure you don't exacerbate that. I don't know if you listened to our recent episode of the podcast, episode 169 of the Fuel Hotel Marketing Podcast, but we talked about exactly this. Like once the conversion online is done, you're not done. Until they come and stay with you, your job is still at hand and you've got to make sure you think of it actually. You keep that reservation. Um, one of the worst things I've seen, and Phil brought this up, I think on the show or maybe after the show, but he saw, he saw a website where he purchased something and, and I don't know if it was hotel or not, but then the, the email confirmation email said, if you want to cancel this order was the, the first thing that came up. I'm like, well, you want to give people the ability to do that, but that's not what you want to promote front Don't and center be because it's creating a sense of doubt. Well, why? Why? Do, why were they mean, asking to cancel? And why? also, too, yeah. get out, get you off the retargeting. Don't browbeat them to death that you show up everywhere now because right. they booked with you. Get them mm -hmm. off of the fact that that conversion means get them off of your retargeting process because that also okay. turns into the oh my god, these people are annoying. Why do I want to stay there? Whether it has nothing to do with my stay, it's just the fact that they're annoying. They're on all every website I'm going to. Hey, it'd be really cool if you had a CRM that did that automatically. Do you know of any CRMs? Uh, maybe the fuel AI powered CRM, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> hey, by the way, did you notice in your Walmart pickups, which by the way, Renee's doing our Thanksgiving Walmart pickup today, which you talking about blowing out the Walmart should send me a Christmas present for the stuff that I want. She's like, Really? All this? And I'm like, yep, need it all. She's like, it's one day. Like, it's just the two of us. <laughs> need it all. So anyway, do you notice all the extra toys and stuff they throw into your bags now? All the, the, the extra promo stuff? Uh -huh. Well, the, the one here, they give you a specific promo bag that has like free well, yeah. samples and stuff. Yeah, like a bunch it. of little samples because you're not yeah. combing the aisles anymore. You're not doing the impulse buying up. Oh, look here. Look here. So they're throwing this stuff in. Which is a, is terrible because it's like, oh, this coconut water is tasty. We should buy some of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 and I'm like, 
oh, this is pretty good stuff. You know, I wouldn't have bought coconut water, but dang, it was tasty. And sure, I'll pick some more up. And they seem to remember they put that in your little list. So when you forget stuff, they're like, I remember buying that, but that was pretty good. So going back to something a little older uh, of the pet friendly stuff. And you know, I've, I've complained about this before. <laughs> Tamara's right. Don't do it long. Yeah, I'd buy an impulse buying squirrel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the pet friendly, I, I am, I'm, I'm really, I almost feel like I want to have a website that's, you're not pet friendly if you're charging hundred bucks a day. You're not that's even, not you're barely idea. pet tolerant. Okay. You're, you know, these places, these, these hotels, and they're not even resorts, they're hotels. You're staying the night and you're paying in some cases almost as much for your pet to be with you that one night as you're paying for them to stay, for you to stay at the hotel. And the, the, the hotels are looking at it as additional funding. There is no fee requirement to have a pet. There is no liability. Well, if the pet does damage to the room. Yeah. Basically, when you rent a room, so to speak, for a hotel, you're liable for any damages. Regardless of whether it's your pet or not, you're still liable for the damage. You don't have to charge to do that. Is there a higher likelihood that a pet can damage your room? Potentially. But it's like resort fee. It's like you're really just getting free money. And when, when did you become so socialist, man? This is this I is know. free market. <laughs> you know? Supply and demand. You know, if, okay. if you're and pay, I'm, I'm okay. If the demand is limited, what's the problem? I, I'm okay. I can't believe when, you're advocating for hotels to make less money right now. It's well, terrible. Yes, when it comes to the fact of charging for unnecessary things. If you're going to charge a pet fee, there's pet, pet, and pet not pet friendly, which means I, you can't have a pet at all, unless it's a service pet. Uh, then you have pet tolerant, which is I want to charge you per day. Okay, But if that's the case, do something you said, Stuart. Give me some treats or, or no, is it, give me some treats. Give me something. You know, I, I've been pushing with one of our clients about they, they give bandanas. Everybody puts for dogs, everybody will put a bandana on their dog, mm -hmm. just even if it's for a day. They go get their hair cut, you know, at the groomer and they come back with a bandana on. So most of and, and they'll they'll do Instagram shots and they'll do social shots. And it's like, why not? Because there's two ways to get to somebody's heart. Take care of their kids, take care of their pets. You do both of those, they're gonna like you. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could you could be treated terrible, but if you they treated your kids good and you treated your pets good. Yeah, you know they might be okay. Um, I think it's fair to charge a little extra to have a pet. I think you got you not the argument that the wear and tear is probably going to be. Make the it a value proposition. Money. Make it a value proposition. Give them a little plastic bowl to be right? forever yeah. used. Okay. Yeah. Give them some treats at the t at the desk when they check in for your pet. That's endearing. Give them a bandana that they can wear around because it also means that you can prove that the pet was checked in, rather than hey, is that dog been checked in? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Where? What room are you in? Where's your room? You know what? <laughs> Gotta go. <laughs> Poop walk. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you've got to be realistic with what you're charging, but I, I think ultimately the the value is that you get to bring your pet to a hotel. Not every hotel can you do that. So I, the market's going to decide. And there's not that many product. like Airbnb too, right? Mm -hmm. So Airbnb owners tend to be, at least in my experience, as I've been looking, there's a lot less pet-friendly Airbnbs than there are pet-friendly hotels, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Could just be yeah. where I'm looking. <laughs> yes, Lauren has had all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> to Stuart's point, though, it is challenging to have a pet in, in the room that you're renting to somebody, whether you be an Airbnb or a hotel or whatever, because they're, 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 pets have accidents. Right. And that causes problems. Even if they don't do that, they lose fur. All right. So you're doing you're you're, you're going through your housekeeping, yeah. your house cleaning, and uh, you miss somebody's fur that was left in the corner. The next guest finds it, and they're mad at you for it. Or that uh, they have an allergy to it, or that leaves an odor. Yeah. Or but that that okay, that's logistics, and I, and and I'm I'm not saying no to fees. Please understand that. But there's a difference between intolerant fees that give you no value proposition. I'm charging you 100 bucks per day for your pet, regardless. Then there's fees that says I'll charge you 100 bucks for the time you stay up to three to five days. Fine, because there is additional cleaning that goes under the room, what have you. But add some value proposition to it. Well, you're paying for something, get something. The value and proposition is you get to have your dog. And you get to choose whether that's a value you're willing to pay for or not. I, mean, I will also say, as a responsible pet owner, I will never bring one of my dogs to a hotel because I know I will be paying to replace everything. <laughs> 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 so for every responsible pet owner, there's probably a lot more irresponsible ones, right? 
So yeah. Well, you can decide whether or not that makes me responsible, or if I should have done a better job of training. But but, but, but yeah, if, if hotels are charging for these things, there should be dog walks. There should be doggy bags. There should be sure. the associated necessity spaces so, for if, those things. That you're that's the niche you want to go after. Go for it, right? But I don't think just I, I don't think you have to do that to say that you're pet friendly. I mean, that's okay pet friendly to the extreme. That's like saying that if you're family friendly, you have to give every kid a sticker and a hat and candy. Like you don't have yep. to. You but by the same token, money. how what would you feel about having to pay extra for your child, even though there's no extra space necessary for them? Well, it, I mean, you would, right? In some cases, some people have extra occupancy fees. Like if, if it wasn't a room that slept four people already, and you wanted to have an extra two people, some people do charge extra. For you that. you wouldn't right? stay at that hotel, or and also, when was the last time you ever had a rollaway? I mean, really? <laughs> 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 I'm like this on the floor. It's fine. Uh, you, yeah. you, put, you put just a few baby diapers in that trash can in the bathroom, and it's forever changed the odor in there. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, you, you, that's what right and up there. My kids eat the furniture and all kinds, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's just sad. Possibly true, but sad. <laughs> I just again, it goes back to the 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 other fees, and then there's also pet friendly hotels that have restrictions as to where the pets can actually go beyond the safety restrictions. Of pet pets can't be around pools; that's a given. Pets can't be in restaurants; that's a given, unless permission for outside, what have you. But there's actually it says it's a pet friendly hotel, but the pets can't go literally anywhere. They literally can be in the room. And then the other part to it, too, is make it a little bit more fun. Put a little door hanger that has the pet's name on it so that housekeeping knows that the pet's in there. Little things that are endearing to the fact that the pet owners, especially now where so many people now have pets that don't have pets before because of what's going on with COVID. And so. here we are back yeah. at Utopia. Do you <laughs> travel with pets? Huh? Do you travel with pets? Do you have pets? Used to, yeah, we have little Edison, which is nowhere to be found right now. He's out front getting sun. I was gonna say, I've never seen you traveling with a pet, and um, you seem awfully passionate about this subject. Yes. Well, when I travel with Renee and Edison, this is my passion. When I travel by myself, it's like, what a pet? What? Gosh, hmm. I can smell it in the room. I'm out. No, it's it's. I, I have a big love for pets, and, and yeah, I mean, you're right about the fact that getting someone's heart to to feel like this is the brand that I'm always going to stay with. If you treat their pet special like like they're the the thing then people are going to do it i mean melissa will always stay at kempton now for that exact reason because they and if, it's, uh, the if it's not yeah. the pet then the way to the heart we all know is through the stomach so mm -hmm. you've got those options or the bar can just <laughs> go ahead and usually <laughs> whatever is at the bar goes through the stomach lauren well oh, yeah, yeah yeah or they bring the bar to the broom which is just any <laughs> <a> very <varied> combination <laughs> Oh, look, wine, amenities. Yay. I love this place. <laughs> no, it, it, it is. If we do, I guess probably the boat onto is that we have to be creative with our engagement with the guests and not just treat it as a check in. There's the key. Go up the elevator. We'll see you when you get out of here. Yeah, uh, that there is that, that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, be hospitable. Be an innkeeper. Yeah. Do that. And the rest is fairly easy. Hey, can we yeah. talk about um, TripAdvisor and their new club? I think Adele sent a link out. I'd seen. Oh it yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's just you know, and of all times for Adele not to be on the show, the Mr. Advisor right. herself. Yeah. So for those that haven't read the the article, TripAdvisor has announced that they're coming up with this this members club. It's going to cost ninety nine dollars a year, and it's it's still a little fuzzy about what they get for it. But it, it sounds like it's discounts and special offers that are exclusive to, to club members. So think of it kind of like the, the you know, Spirit Airlines does their, their $9 fare club. You have to pay an annual fee for. Um, so uh, this is an interesting pivot for TripAdvisor, right? But it, it the strategy, I think, is smart because we've been talking for how long about how really TripAdvisor and the OTAs in general could become obsolete over time because – that Google really is the gatekeeper to their business. Like the vast majority of folks that go to TripAdvisor come through Google now. It didn't used to be the way, the, the, the way that it is because TripAdvisor was synonymous with reviews. TripAdvisor was the destination, but now people kind of gone away from that because TripAdvisor lost sight of what made them great. They were really good advocates for con consumers and they've gone too far in the way of the hotels. So this is a play for me that if TripAdvisor executes it 
well, which I think we could debate whether that's likely or not, given their track record, it, it could take away some of the control that Google has on them and, and make TripAdvisor a destination again where people begin their search, which which I think would be a good thing for their, their shareholders. So discuss. I, I think it could be very interesting. They've got to get buy-in, obviously, first. If they don't get any buy-in, then no, nothing else I say next is going to matter. But if they do get some buy-in, so now they start having these member rates and these special rates, and, and again, I'm going to take it back to MetaSearch because that's where I go. But again, Google, a lot of their traffic is generated by MetaSearch, including even TripAdvisor advertising on Google Meta, right? So now all of a sudden, if TripAdvisor has a closed user group rate, can they start marketing that on Google just the same way that a hotel would market their loyalty rates, right? Where you see it's crossed out and says, hey, get a lower rate here with membership. Uh, it meets all the criteria, all the qualifications. Mm -hmm. But now all of a sudden, as soon as, soon as we start doing that, We've been fighting these battles with wholesalers undercutting our rates for years. Finally getting a grip on that, does this cause a problem with another closed user group? Maybe, maybe not. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, 100%. And that doesn't solve our problem as hoteliers, right? Because now, like, we want we want as many middlemen out of the pie as possible, right? right? And right now, you, you literally could have a situation where someone goes to Google and, and does a meta search, lands on something like Trivago, another meta search, or TripAdvisor, another meta search, and then ends up on Expedia and books. And then you've got yep. Google, TripAdvisor, and Expedia all taking a percentage of, of your booking, essentially, yep. right? Yep. Although they're not physically taking a percentage, someone's paying for it somewhere along the line. So ideally, if we could get someone like TripAdvisor to become uh, the destination where people start and end their, their booking, it's a better scenario for us. There's fewer hands in the cookie jar. But yeah. I, I, I personally don't have confidence that TripAdvisor will, will pull this off. But I think, to me, it's interesting that they're trying something new. And we've talked a lot about yeah. having to reinvent yourself and pivot this year and be agile. And this, this is, I think, the beginning of what we'll see a lot of. A lot of people are going to start trying new revenue stream models, new, new strategies to try to attract guests. OTAs are probably going to follow suit with something similar would be my guess. And they're all going to call it Expedia Plus and TripAdvisor Plus and whatever plus because every every member or driven everything except for Amazon Prime right now is something plus. So that's what they'll do. I, I, I guess I'll, that I'll, yeah, I, 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 my first reaction to when I saw this was I thought they did it backwards. Just my personal. It's, I kind of equated it and I don't know why things pop in my head the way they do. Gosh, my wife here tries to figure that out too. No one um, will ever know. No, no. <laughs> I don't I'm not worried about what's going would on. You buy, would, would you buy a cruise club right now? $99. Get discounts at cruises. It would be hard for me to join any travel related club without knowing what I get. Right. Yeah. Because you right know, now, I'm so used to I'm so used to getting discounts. I probably wouldn't join any club that only offered me a discount because then I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, now I have to do the math and figure out if the cost right. of joining outweighs the discount. That's the thing. You're if you're gonna pay for it because you're about to use it, you don't join AAA because you're never gonna drive. You're not gonna join a cruise club if you're not gonna cruise. Right now, nobody's gonna do the cruise thing for a while. They're not even operating. They went over and tried it and it didn't work too well. I know, man. Uh, Those cruise <laughs> people are crazy. They, they, yeah, they, well, they, that's they, true. That's mm -hmm. true. Um, but the idea of, of whether to use it or not use it, they're asking for people to pay for something that they made themselves not directly use. And to your point, Lily, discounts are already there for incentives as well. You have to really be doing something very unique for me to say, I'm going to pay that much money to get something of value that I think that that compensates for. Like when you do Amazon prime two day shipping, you're like me. I mean, I saved it in shipping dudes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, my, the, as Amazon funny. dude knows my address. He knows exactly where to put it on my, my, my doorstep because it's in the shade. He know, you know, he doesn't even send me a picture. He just like Lauren, dude, coffee and your box is there, you know? So, you know, there, there's, there's a value proposition to, if you're going to spend for something like that, to me, TripAdvisor should have said, we're going to start this, sign up. Let's then give you the value proposition of being a participant to this, that you took the initiative to join us. And then, and I know this is going to piss people off, now we're going to start incrementing a value to spending with us to get more value proposition. So that, you know, now you have an audience to talk to beyond just the user audience. People that have said they've taken the extra step. Maybe you created and said, hey, get, good luck. You were the early adopter. You get in. You don't have to pay for the first year for nothing. Okay? Yeah. We're going to give you all this benefit. But if you and like it, then it's going to cost $99 the second year. 
I did that with the loyalty. I told you that from way back in the day. We gave everybody when we first started a loyalty program the second best tier just for being a repetitive guest to the resort. And then if they liked it, which means that they proved the value for having it, then they paid for keeping that level of relationship with us the following year. And we got a lot of people that did that. You know, we get we proved the value first before they spent the money to have. Lawrence to keep the talking in code. He's not really talking about a hotel. He's talking about when he used to push drugs. 100%. <laughs> well, <laughs> there is a drug marketing scheme of getting yeah. yeah. pay. That's just me. <laughs> well, it's like taking it back to the what would Amazon do? It's exactly what you described. They're right. I can get Amazon Prime free for whatever three months. Uh, which I'll then use over the holidays and cancel, but that aside, uh, it gives me the opportunity to try it out and see if I like Wait, it. Wait, what? Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you don't have Amazon. Amazon. You don't have Amazon. <laughs> wow. Wow. You're like living under a rock somewhere. Uh, yeah, I feel like we just uncovered a Neanderthal, like that we just yeah. dug up someone from the dinosaur Evo- age. Evolution is true. Um, <laughs> you really don't have Prime? I, I do every now and then when I need it, and then I ditch it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I think it really like all of this comes down to if you can make somebody's life easier or better, right? Like that's that's the core. That can be manifested in multiple ways. For me, using Amazon, it's not just a like, oh, I need to calculate whether or not I'm going to save this in shipping because guess what? I get my stuff faster and I'm the type of person who doesn't always plan ahead. Like I like to know that there's a birthday coming up that I wait, forgot to get a present for and I can just send it right wait, out there. Wait, wait, wait. You're the most organized person that I give credit to. You I, can't be that. Pre- you can't have those I have in the armor. this great facade <laughs> uh, which is covering up a large team of people who manage me. When you tell um, me, when you, excuse me, when you ask me to do something, there's a list right underneath of it of all the things that you're asking me to do specifically. She's the way thorough. You want She's not organized. I'm thorough. Not or- yeah, yeah, very different. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, just planning ahead and knowing what day it is. Those are things uh. that I struggle with. <laughs> so I think like that, and now they're moving towards one day shipping, which is great. So also though, it's de-risking it, right? Because I know that if anything goes wrong with this product, I can return it for free with no hassle whatsoever. In fact, now all I have to do is take the product itself, not even in a box, to UPS and hand it to them, and they will box it for me and return it and put the label and do all mm. of the things. Yeah. It would be even better if they picked it up from me, which I assume will come later. But they've made my life easier, and now I find myself holding every other online retailer to Amazon standards like, I don't know if I want to order from them. I will pay more if I can find this product on Amazon. Yeah, like five day shipping? What is this? I can't wait five <laughs> right. days. Some of them are still two weeks. Like I know. I just ordered a couch from my mother in law. It's gonna be fourteen weeks. I'm like, what? wow. Oh. But that's you did that on ahead. purpose. You can't hide behind that, Stuart. <laughs> I don't even know where I'm gonna live in fourteen weeks. I mean anything could happen. You did that on purpose. Look, I bought you a couch fourteen weeks later. Uh, <laughs> okay, so just to see if we have the true unicorn Bigfoot. So, Dean, do you have Disney Plus? I do. Oh, whew, okay. Uh, oh, see, that okay. I don't. I've got a kid. I've got an 11. Okay, year. just checking. Yeah, but yeah. Amazon yeah. Prime, I mean, video. Kids on Disney okay. Plus. And I had to watch Mandalorian. So, you know. I, mean, this is the right. you know, I, did, a, I did a Dean thing here, right? When they released Hamilton, I definitely signed up for the free trial on Disney+. Plus. Yeah. Then I found out I had to pay for it, which was fine. I literally think I paid $30 for a month of Disney+, Plus in order to watch Hamilton. Yeah. And it was <laughs> worth it. Disney but, Plus is 5 bucks a month. Or it's $12. Okay, whatever it was. It's thirteen dollars with ESPN Plus and Hulu as well. It's like and then, you know, by the way, if you had to happen to have uh, uh, Roku stock, congratulations for being having the foresight of buying it because it is freaking off the chart right now. Oh um, and also, right now, uh, this is the time to be in those mediums like Disney Plus and and uh, All Access and stuff because right now the, the big movie producers are like looking for places to put out their product. And they're not, you know, with the increased lockdowns, they're pushing this now on these platforms. There's movies, first run movies that are coming out now that are going to be on these platforms. That well, look at what Disney's you know, doing with their like print premiere stuff. So you actually license this the the subscription, 
but then they pay you, you have to pay again extra for specific releases. For specific stuff, yeah. You know? so. Now, the only one I've seen them do that with is Mulan so far. Have they done it with anything besides that? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think. There's another one that's coming out that way, and I don't remember what it is. But my, they, from what I read, Mulan was a success, and they're going to try it with, with more content. So yeah, I thought that was, was, good. One, there was good. Yeah, what happened on the stage? Yeah. Was that? Hey. Yeah, speaking of and coordinating too, because Lily, you brought up something you didn't know if it was completely in context to do, but you brought up Hamilton, and uh, if, you know, you I have the little Google Assistant that has a screen on it, and upcoming was when uh, I blew off everybody at the digital uh, or the marketing conference and go to Hamilton in person uh, this past year early. You had to like do that. There was no question. Uh, yeah. I was yeah. only mad that I didn't also have the opportunity <laughs> to blow everybody else off and go to him. So the pictures I took when I was at the theater seem to have an extra magic to them now because mm -hmm. it was really one of the last times that, you know, being out and about and so forth before everything started coming locked down in March and, and every other than the conference I got to share meaningfully with Stuart. Last hug from Stuart was in March, March 12th, 2020. <laughs> wow, that was quite a hug. Yeah, well, you know, it's memorable. Uh, it's memorable, but, but every hug from Lauren is quite a hug. It's it's uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but but going and seeing Hamilton in person, in as much as I loved it on Disney Plus, it made it more special because I saw it in person. And you're talking about we're going through this whole thing now, where it's getting way worse again. Not you know, and 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 I had an argument actually with Ed. You know, does it have to be worse than it was before to be still bad? just lose one person. It doesn't matter how many other thousands get lost. It's that one person you lost or the one person you knew that got lost. And so mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be worse than July to be worse. It's worse than what it has been. It's gotten worse and it's continued to get worse. It's affecting areas like Dean's that never got affected before. And it is by far, you know, in, in ways as bad as ever because of, of the losses and so forth. That is, you're catching that at the end of a cycle. And I guess maybe why you brought this up a little was, we had so many troopers through our industry that try to survive until they saw the end of the tunnel, light at the end of the tunnel. We thought we were getting closer to it. We thought we were coming through it. And then all of a sudden, nope, that light was a train. Uh, and now we're back into the thick of the darkness again. That, in, in, Yes, we have things that are coming up, hopefully, that will help us. But it's not going to get better for the holiday where we had hoped it would have been. Not for and, the holiday. And, yeah. And, and, and the holidays, I guess. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know. Their depression is a real thing. People going to work, real thing. How to be happy and, and, and helpful and hospitable to people when you yourself are struggling with that same feeling is a powerful discussion to have in hospitality right now. Regardless of the marketing, we're kind of in a, a polarity. We're telling people there's an opportunity to travel with us because we want you to. But we also want to make sure everybody stay safe and not to, you know, we want people to be able to survive uh, by business as well. So anyway, I kind of opened the door for what you wanted to say, Lily. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I just wanted to, because I think that this really affects everybody, talk a little bit about something that I feel like we kind of gloss over in the hospitality industry. We don't really talk about the whole person very often, maybe as much as we should. And there's a lot of kind of bravado in the industry, which is often covering up some themes of uh, different types of emotions. But the one that I wanted to just kind of talk about a little bit today was grief. Um, because I think that at some point this year, whether or not we're in it right now or not, we've all experienced a type of grief. And one of the things about grief is that it's very nuanced. So to your point, Lauren, there's kind of the obvious, oh, I, I lost my hotel, or maybe I lost a family member or a friend to COVID. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can feel grief, but those are kind of the obvious ones. So for those who may need a little bit of validation today, I wanted to explain a little bit about two types of grief. And one of them is called anticipatory grief. So this is when you're expecting something to happen that will cause you to grieve. And so you begin grieving before the event even happens. So this might happen if you're fearful that you're going to lose your hotel or you're fearful that you're going to lose a family member or somebody close to you, or you're, you could be fearful of just about anything, right? But it actually begins the grieving process mm -hmm. uh, in advance of the actual loss. And sometimes, uh, as a society in general, we downplay that like, oh, it hasn't happened yet. Like, buck up. Everything's fine. And so I think that really taking a moment to honor and feel that grief, it is a valid 
type of grief that people need to process. Um, and the other one that's kind of nuanced is ambiguous grief. So the obvious example of this is when somebody that you love gets Alzheimer's and you mm. begin to grieve the person who was because that's no longer the person that they are. So you have lost them, but not not physically, perhaps. Right. And I think that also becomes nuanced. And what I find, this has been true for me this year, that I'm dealing with ambiguous grief, but less about a person and more about the way things used to be, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I hate the term new normal for multiple reasons, not just this one, but it's always my hope that we'll go back to the way that things used to be because I feel grief about not being able to experience life in the way that we used to before. I don't want us to have to wear masks for the rest of our lives and things like that. So just kind of dealing with these different types of emotions, I think I want to encourage people, especially as we approach the holidays, because a lot of emotions come up around the holidays. You may have anxiety about being with your family. You may have, you know, sadness or grief about not being able to be with your family. There's all different things that can happen. And I think that sometimes we judge ourselves for having these emotions, right? Because we're like, oh, we don't have it that bad. Somebody might have it worse than me, or maybe we feel like something that we're feeling isn't valid. But I find that if you just allow yourself to be with it for a little bit, the only way to move through these emotions is to actually experience them and come mm -hmm. out the other side. The more you push them down, the more it's going to result in anxiety and anger and all of those things. So really taking a moment to kind of honor what's going on for you right now as we deal with all these, you know, what if things shut down again? Oh, but there's a vaccine. We're getting so many mixed messages all the time. And I think it really can do some damage to our psyche if we don't take a moment to just kind of honor the process and be with it. So that's just what I wanted to share today. Well said. I, I think yeah, one of the, the one of the ones that I've seen in the, the ambiguous grief that I don't think people realize but they're just sad and they don't know why. And to your point, I think a lot of people are realizing they've lost a part of themselves because their job was their identity. Either they lost their job or, or the job has changed a lot or they're not traveling like they used to for their, like it's, they're not the person they were and that was their identity. And so there's, there's a mm -hmm. lot of folks, I think that are struggling with that. Like, who am I in this mm -hmm. new normal in this world? Because it, it, I don't yeah. recognize the person that I've become. And oh. Yeah, it's, it's tough to deal with. I'd even add to that, uh, we all know from being in the industry, you put on your game face. You, when you walk out, you can have whatever turmoil is in the back of the house, but when you're in front of the house, you're, you're centric on guests and so forth. And I think the, the biggest uh, moment in, in, that I think back to is when Robin Williams died. Mm -hmm. Here's a person that was everything you thought about joy. I mean, the man was amazing and of the happiness that he spread but little did you know the inside was so sad and we can get lost personifying everything's fine remain calm we're good we're here for you we're gonna and you and you can make that shell but in the meanwhile if you're not taking get part of the internal you're not satisfying all the things you just pointed out about the anxieties the apprehensions the fears the all the things that are core inside of you and you begin to put this outward shell all of a sudden it can collapse on itself you lose to what you just said Stuart, the identity you, you're portraying one thing, but in fact, you're something else and people don't see it coming. We have so many examples, Robin Williams is just one of them, you know, of the outward looking veneer is everything's great and happy, fine, where the inside is a loss, you know, uh, and people that were amazing at that and people that you respected had great insights to the world, you know, uh, the uh, Bourdain, uh, you know, when he was traveling the world and shared all the things about the joy of life and so forth. And then here that happens. It's just, so if it can happen to people like that, it can happen to any one of us at that sense that we put out an outward appearance, but inside we can be poor. Um, to be careful of that and to be open about that. I think the, probably the key element to that is don't be fearful of sharing that. Of If you're feeling apprehensive, if you're having the anxiety, uh, you know, make sure that you're not the only one that knows that. That, you know, making that way, well, even the advertisement, that awkward moment, take the advantage of uh, uh, noticing to people that you know best the, um, something's not right or you seemed a little you normally are different or you know whatever and make sure that it gets brought out because keeping it to yourself it's like when you're exercising you want to lose weight if you don't want to share with everybody else so that they can give you incentive because you're afraid they're going to also criticize you you're not really 
dedicated to it. You got to really share out and say, hey, I need help. I want to make a change in my life. And I think you guys are going to keep me in line with that if I share with you that that's what I want to do. Same thing with this. You've got to make sure that people know that you're struggling with your identity or struggling with your purpose or struggling with staying happy, given all the things that are going on. So, yes, it is a point that does get glossed. I think yeah. that I uh, was scared of that vulnerability for years, thinking it would affect my job prospects, mm. uh, my employee reviews. And in hindsight, um, I worked in a few toxic workplaces where maybe it wouldn't have been appropriate to share. So um, if anybody listening feels like they're in that situation and they don't have somebody to share with, I just want to say that my door is open. I'm always happy to have those conversations. Um, I also have a great... Um, we don't really know what to call her, but I would say a therapist is the closest thing. She's really uh, kind of more magical than your typical therapist. But uh, one of the reasons that this is on my mind is I went and did some deep work with her this past weekend, like two six hour days of really digging through all of this. And uh, I know that she's just really great at being able to help support and give space for that type of processing as well. So if anybody needs a recommendation, I'm always uh, happy to help with that. Yeah, and, and I, I would say in general, there's, there's a stigma associated with mental health and, and for sure. you know, use the word, word vulnerability. I think I think the more we talk about it, you know, openly in, in situations like this and publicly and, and acknowledge that everyone goes through challenges like this, I think it, it becomes more normalized and, and people feel a little better because they realize, you know, they're not so different and they're not, you know, strange and that they can talk to people about it and that it's okay. And they have, going back to that word we used earlier, they have permission to, to deal with this openly and yeah. without shame. It, it's it's something we all deal with. And there's a lot of resources. You know, one of the things that's been really good about COVID is seeing how many folks have rallied together to try to help with mental health issues. And things like dealing with grief and, and, and all the challenges that have come. And so that there are a lot of online therapists now that, that are free, you know, or, or a lot of your, a lot of healthcare providers, even like our Blue Cross Blue Shield is offering some free resources. If you just need someone to talk to and everybody needs someone to talk to at times. Right? Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. Ironically, uh, my, it, it's when you brought this up in the email, I'm like, wow. I mean, either I'm in sync with what you're thinking or I just happen to be inspired that I'm following a great lead. But when this COVID first started, I did that uh, open chat room, We Are Hospitality, and I did it every day at noon for people to come and just talk. Just It had nothing to do with a show like this. It had just, we seem to have a commonality of hospitality. If you want to talk about the weather, you want to talk about whatever. And I was going to start it right after Thanksgiving again because holidays are down. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they can be downers, they, especially if the traditions that you're familiar with aren't able to be done this year, which we know is true. Right. And that isolation is even compounded more because the, the relief of being able to at least have the holidays with family isn't even there. And and then you add it to the stresses of maybe what you're doing, whether you're employed or not employed and all the other compounds and variabilities that people are dealing with. And I'm like, I'm just going to open it back up again. Uh, and so I was. I mean, literally the Monday after Thanksgiving, uh, I was going to go over and say, hey, at noon, we are hospitality. It's it's uh, it's bit.ly uh, B.I.T. dot L.Y. forward slash we are hospitality, literally no space. Uh, I'm there at noon every day. And when there's nobody shows, no problem. If you show, I'll talk about all the geeky stuff that drives me crazy. Like, for instance, Oculus, you can go and do meditation. You can be on a beach in Bali and breathe there's Real a thing guru that'll be right there with you and breathe actually it's strange you bring it up because it's like i i, I get this pl platform called alcove which had this health section to it and it had meditations and stuff i'm like eh, whatever and i go in there i'm like this is pretty cool i mean first off the virtual i'm on a beach is pretty cool but the other that the person's training you how to breathe and relax and 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 just enjoy the, the visualization of being there uh, was actually like, I'm going to go back and do this pretty regularly because I like this. This is pretty cool. It's a nice pause to the chaos. Yeah. So. Meditation is is one of the tools that I use and I've used for a long time. And it took me a while to get it. Like I, I dabbled, I'd say, for a long time and I didn't really see it. But then after being, it's like any exercise, right? When you When you really commit to it and do it fully for like 30, 60, 90 days, it's different for anyone. But it made such a difference, like being mindful, like Lily, Lily talking about, you know, acknowledging your emotions. That's one of the things that mindfulness talk teaches you, right? It, it's being present with your emotion, recognizing that it is an emotion that you're feeling. It's not who you are. It doesn't define you. Being able to, to 
wrestle with that in your mind and accept it and forgive yourself when you feel the way you feel, it's okay. Mindfulness is, is one of the most powerful techniques known to man. And it's not spiritual. It's not ho hokey. It's rooted in science. I'm, I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a science major. I have a physics degree. I'm not a spiritual person in that way. And yet mindfulness is one of the most powerful tools I know. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yes. Lauren, when you were trying to sell me on Oculus, this meditation and Bali thing would have probably been a better avenue than let's shoot people <laughs> together. So, well, the thing uh, is, well, I'm value interested. for shooting things. Just know <laughs> your audience. <laughs> by way, doing the work, you can go audience, shoot Lauren. <laughs> There's a satisfaction of winning a game where everybody else is trying to shoot you. I'm just saying it's kind of makes you feel warm and fuzzy that you won. I'm not <laughs> invalidating that. I'm just saying. <laughs> There's some and I'm more drawn to, to meditating on Molly. Yeah, and lightsaber stuff, when you're fighting with a lightsaber, yeah. very therapeutic. Very therapeutic. <laughs> yeah, there's a hotel marketing lesson there, Lauren. Right? Understanding your audience and, and tailoring your message. Tailoring the message. I need to go into the thing. Actually, the honestly, you would love it because the meditation thing, I was very impressed with it. There's good VR and there's eh, VR. This is, you're on the beach. I mean, you're there. You're, you know, all 360, there's, I'm, I'm trees that up. There's a beach in front of you that sounds in 5D. Right. Uh, that might have actually which, sold me as well. Lauren, which app is that? What's that one called? It's called it, 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 the, uh, the, the platform is called Alcove. Alcove. And in Alcove yeah. is a uh, section that's called Health and Meditation. You go in there, and that's one of the things you can do. Plus, you can go visit anywhere in the world you want to have this beautiful globe. You spin around and say, I want to go yeah. there. And it brings you all the VRs that are available in that, that uh, part of the world. And you go and take a bus trip through London or you know, whatever, a scooter ride in Paris or something. It's, it's amazing. Cool. So, but yeah, it's called yeah. Alco. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I, th I think it's worth pointing out with all this too and, and putting a wrapper on it kind of is that, and I don't mean this to minimize anything. In fact, the exact opposite, everybody is going through this. Everybody has been touched or impacted in some way, shape or form by the, by this COVID virus. And, and like I said, I'm not saying that to minimize anyone's experience, the exact opposite. There are other people that are doing the exact same thing that you are reach out to them and be, and be a part of that community. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I will say at the, at the beginning, I, I really struggled with it. it. It was really hard. I felt like I'd lost a, a part of me. And I think a lot of people did. In Lauren, your your daily touch base, your therapy session that you did made a real impact in, in how I viewed the world, like sharing my fears and my hopes with other people who were going through the same thing really, really did help. And, oh, and cool. Lauren is the furthest thing from a trained psychologist. <laughs> but, As a matter of um, fact, I'm usually the uh, the uh, case study. Now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> usually the patient for sure. But just just sharing, talking to other people that were yeah. experiencing similar things or could empathize with me made made the world a difference. So thank you for doing that, Lauren. And I would encourage everyone to to find that community, even if it's a community of one even if it's a professional or just a friend or your spouse, just talk to someone yeah. about it. If you're feeling these things, you need to acknowledge it. Ignoring it is not going to help you in the long term. No, no, that's for sure. That's for sure. Well, um, thank you. I mean, two hours plus, and we could probably keep on talking for lots of fun things, mm -hmm. but I'm glad we were able to get to it, Lily, as well. Thank you. It was always appropriate. It's never inappropriate, and, and it is a part of, well, you know, whether it be hospitality marketing or not, it's, it's, it's message and perspective, which really – you know, marketing is marketing. Um, with that in mind, we're going to be, I'm going to be, you know, we keep the tradition alive. Now, so far, there have been years where I've been alone by myself the day after Thanksgiving on the show, just saying. And also the day after Christmas, just saying. If anybody would like to join me for those shows, we do them anyway. <laughs> oh, there, will, there will be one, you're saying? Huh? There will be one then? Every Friday. Oh, wait. Never missed a Friday. Never, never missed a Friday. Never missed a week in all these years. Never. And even if I'm, and they, they, these are the shows that tend to be, hi guys, it's Lauren. Uh, it's, it's short. It's yeah. Consistent. Yeah. So if anybody wants Christmas, to join. Christmas Day is on a Friday this year. Oh, is it? Oh, well, you know, between presents and eggnog, I guess. I don't know. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I do it anyway. His Christmas celebration and call it. <laughs> I'll, I'll wear a Santa hat if it helps anybody deciding uh, on joining. And, and then um, we'll put up Charlie Brown Christmas, let that play, and away you hey, go. At least it's going on PBS. Boy, did that yeah. be a lot of people that <laughs> Apple ate it up and then wasn't, you know, yeah. But at least it's on PBS for those who want to still catch it. Uh, you know, it's uh, unbelievable that that's where it had to go, but yeah. Yeah, well, anyways. Um, so <laughs> we will be having show number 277 next week, next Friday, 1130 a.m. Eastern, uh, um, for those who would like to join. 
Uh, mm. I will try to keep it interesting and lively, even if I am a solo act. I do great hand puppets uh, <laughs> and uh, shadow puppets and stuff. So, um, Just bring but, out uh, your list you. of tools, Lauren. That will for sure take two hours. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, actually, I'm very proud of my podcast because I have kept it within 20, 25 minutes. It's, it's and, I, and I still throw tools in there, and I even have more to share uh, stuff. Yeah, so it's been pretty good. By the way, speaking of podcasts, Lily, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> just, you know. Yes. Waiting for the next one. <laughs> I think you're going to have it today, in theory. Actually, hey, just also so you know, Dean's done a really cool thing. He's, because you don't have to follow, I have to follow mine with the live show recap, so I can't really do them in advance, but he's been pumping them to me. They're scheduled out. Yeah. yeah. So he's, 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 he's got a buffer. Unless I'm, something I'm changes. I'm working on that myself, actually. That's, that's so, a holy grail, man. Yeah. That's, that's tough. Yep, I've got a whole, I've got a whole list I'm working on, but, uh, I believe my next one is actually going to be uh, digging a little bit more into She Has a Deal, which we had uh, up here on the show, um, what, two weeks ago, I think. So I that, that yeah, should be our, our next one coming out. And I did ask, reach out to Amy. Amy wasn't getting my invites to join us again. She wanted to come back from get-go. She wanted to come back yeah. in again. And Amy hadn't been getting my invites, so I reached her with a different email account. She says, no, I haven't been getting them. So she's now in tune again. She couldn't do today, but she'll try to jump back in with us again. And Tracy always is welcome from, from uh, she has a deal. And then um, the um, Adele's podcast, I got finally her audio today. So it will be going up today. Uh, so Adele's reputation management uh, podcast will go live today. It'll take a couple of weeks or a week plus for it to get propagated on iTunes and so forth. Uh, but it'll go up and be good. And I do have to next, no, if it's not next week with the audience, but whenever we get back together in a group again, I got to talk about Hulu's new beta program for advertising. That's yeah, incredible. It's rocks. <laughs> Who's? Huh? That's a good teaser. Oh, yeah, okay. well, because I mean, it's dirt cheap and you're totally localized. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> demographics, shows, geography. It's like, I want to talk to you when you watch this yeah, show. Let's talk Boom. about that next episode because I got some interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is yeah. crazy. The beta. I mean, yeah. the limitation is I can only have one client on it, which really irritated me. But I think I got into the back door because I begged. Just saying, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was sending them an invite every week. They kept saying, "Thank you for your interest. We'll let you know next year." Thank you for your interest. Next year, finally, I'm like, Bloop. you know, they're like, "Okay, we can let you do this entry." but you can only do this account because of your agency size. I'm like, fine, good, I'll do it. So anyway, it's pretty cool though. It really is a pretty cool tool. Thank you all for your time today. And thank you, Lily, for both the topic and, and the discussion and uh, Stuart, Dean, obviously. And then for those, uh, for the, anybody wants to know about Flip2, Ed was around, Flip2, Flip.to. Uh, who else dropped? Oh, Tamara, uh, Tammy uh, from uh, Milestone Me uh, Internet. Um, oh, oh, Ben from 3&6. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. Anyway, I'll make sure they're all in the show notes. I got them written down. Just can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, thank you all. And we will hopefully see some of you, if all of you, next week. And then remember, uh, after Thanksgiving, for those in case you missed next week's show, we'll start the We Are Hospitality starting on Monday, which would be the tw just the end before the end of this. What is the calendar date for Monday? 27th, 28th, 30th. 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 Um, yeah, November 30th. We'll start up that. So go and join for that. Thank you all. We'll see everybody hopefully next week. If not, a very happy Thanksgiving, Trevor. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.